It's time for Twig this week in Google Amp Pruitt, Jeff Jarvis, and a very special guest from Tech Dirt. Mike Masnick joins us. We'll talk about Section 230 and how the Senate keeps trying to take it down along with encryption. We'll talk about Parler. <laughs> They're banning users now. This week in Cancel Culture, Twitch, YouTube, Reddit, so many people canceled. And a way to buy a card game invented by the CIA. It's all coming up next on Twig. This Week in Google comes to you from our LastPass studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 566, recorded Wednesday, July 1st, 2020. Thunderbolt and lightning. This Week in Google is brought to you by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud? Wasabi is enterprise-class cloud storage at one-fifth the price of Amazon S3 and faster than the competition with no fees for egress or API requests and no complex storage tiers. Start a free trial at wasabi.com under the code TWIT. And by LastPass. Give your IT department a break and supply them with the tools that really protect your business. Visit lastpass.com slash TWIT to find out how they can help you. It's time for Twig This Week in Google, the show we cover the latest news from everywhere, including Google. <laughs> uh, Aunt Pru, it's back. Good to have you, Aunt. Uh, hands on yes, sir, yes, sir. Hands on wellness. <laughs> Always a pleasure to see the beautiful face and the bald pate of Mr. Pruitt. <laughs> Clean as a whistle today. As a Ooh. whistle. Also, <laughs> also Good to with see us, you, sir. Yeah, nice to see you. Also with us, Jeff Jarvis, Professor. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, 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 okay. Hold on, wait. I gotta get my crib sheet. The Leonard Tao breath. Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Hello, and also blogger at uh, BuzzMachine.com. And I'm a very happy professor and blogger today because I worship our guest. I was I was <laughs> jumping up and down in my seat with his latest 230 trick we talked about last week. I uh, He does God's work. He has the right attitude. He's smart. He tears down other people so I don't have to. And now you can introduce him. <laughs> we actually talk about Mike Masnick all the time. We have for years. His Tech Dirt blog is really one of the best covering uh, tech, the intersection of technology and politics. It's great to have you on, Mike. Good to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, we, I, every week my, my ears buzz. Uh, but now, now I get to actually be here. Yeah, actually, last week we were talking about your very clever idea to create a kind of permanent post explaining Section 230, and it's divided up into, like, responses to common errors people make about Section 230. Everybody from the New York Times to this show. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty common people misunderstood, misunderstand what uh, Section Mike, 230 is. can you do me a big favor? Can you, can you violate quarantine and go to New York and walk into Joe Scar Scarborough's studio and sit him the <laughs> F down and explain what the F section 230 is. He's, oh, he's a gone on a full moral panic tirade every morning. I think, uh oh, here it, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. This, oh no. Uh, <laughs> this is, oh, he's not the only one. Oh God. No, <laughs> that's true. God, no, that's true. Mm, this is the uh, post we mentioned last week. Hello. You've been referred here because you're wrong about section 230 of the communications decency act. Uh, and, and uh, which is great because we all need this link. Uh, so that we can send people. And then it has, uh, if you want, if you said, and then various things you might have said, like, well, once a company that start, likes that starts moderating content, it's, it's not a platform, it's a publisher. And then Mike says, I regret to inform you, you are wrong. <laughs> you are full of crap. <laughs> you are wrong. So honestly, it is complicated. It's hard to understand. There's really two parts to 230. And so it's it's confusing to people. None le less confused, none more confused than the Congress of the United States of America, which consistently seems to um, not only misunderstand 230, even though they enacted it as part of the Communications Decency Act, the only part that's still around, 
but uh, but they constantly are trying to undermine it lately, most lately with the Earn It Act. Um, yeah. And I'm glad you've taken this on because honestly, <laughs> I yeah. can't. I uh, I, sometimes I feel like I am uh, the last man fighting this fire, <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you and Jeff Kossoff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's only but, 26 words, but uh, it seems to be amazing, hard to no. understand. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, if you actually read it, it's, it shouldn't be that hard to understand. I think part of the problem is that uh, a lot of the people criticizing it have never even bothered to read it, right. even though it is yep. it's pretty pretty short and sweet. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and if they haven't read it, then, you know, or if they read it and they still don't understand it, they can read Jeff's book, which is quite readable and really enjoyable. Uh, even yeah. even if you're not deep in the weeds on these things, you know, I, I actually the funny thing I've said about Jeff's book is that when I got it, I figured, you know, I'll flip through it and skim it. But I know the story of 230 and I know the law and I know the history and the cases and all that kind of stuff. And it just sucked me in because it's so well written and so interesting. And it has all sorts of yep. information and, uh, you know, details that I I didn't even know, even though I kind of live in this world. So but it's it's a great book. I'm sure you guys have recommended it before. Many but times, I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Jeff Kossoff, the 26 words that created the internet. Please do pick it up. Yep. Yeah. I have it. I haven't read it. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you should. Once, I once will. You start, I'm very it good. Really does. It <laughs> sucks you in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know because uh, I mean, you think here's here's a book about a law, like an entire book about a single law about the internet. How interesting can it be? And it is the type of book that normally I would get and put on my shelf and never actually read. But I am telling you, it is worth actually trying to read it. Yeah, I put it there so people will think I've read it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, that, that would be me, just sort of a poser with <laughs> yeah. it. Kind of thing. Oh, as Jeff says. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, why is 230 important? Uh, I mean, it's what, what, what Jeff's book, the subtitle says, it created the internet, it created the modern internet. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of incredible to, to, to think about it, but you look at kind of the history of how the internet came about. And, and um, even if, if you go back like 100 years and you go to the history of like television and radio and, and especially radio and how that came about, where in the early days radio had a chance to be sort of the, the proto-internet um, where it could be anybody communicating with anybody. And it switched uh, and there were powers that be that sort of forced it into being just a broadcast medium. So, you know, a sort of one to many situation and you lost the ability for it to be, uh, you know, one to one, one to many kind of kind of communications. I think Mar internet Marconi actually said that. He said, why would you want to do one to many? <laughs> that seems like yeah. a waste. <laughs> it, it was not his intention, certainly. No. And, and, um, and, and then you have something like Section 230, which somewhat accidentally um, really said, the internet to be this platform that could do, uh, you know, many to many communication and, and allow people to, to have their voice online. And, you know, some people like to claim that it's like the, the biggest gift to, to big tech or whatever. Um, but I think it's actually the biggest gift to free speech because it, it really Amen. set it up so that, so that internet sites could host speech uh, without being afraid of it, of, of being sued out of existence because somebody posted something that was yeah. defamatory or otherwise violated the law. It's why we can have a chat room. It's why your yes, blog, exactly. people's blogs can have comments. Uh, you know, Google has the resources to protect itself, but do you to protect yourself because your blog comments? So it's right. important that we have that... And and I I would go even further than that. The, the things that some people don't understand is that you know 230 technically protects users as well. So like the comment space, you know, if you post something on Facebook and then the comment space beneath your post, if somebody says something there, you want to be protected. Uh, and 230 does that. 230 protects you. It protects their cases involving uh, people forwarding an email. Uh, and and getting sued because they forwarded an email and 230 protected them also. So it does a whole bunch of things that actually protects the free speech of everybody using the internet. And without it, it would you know it would stifle speech and, and create a real chilling effect on on the internet uh, and, and the way it functions. And we'd have something very different, probably something a lot more akin to to broadcast television and radio rather than you know something where anybody can communicate. Which is exactly why the broadcasters and the radio people want it that way. Yes. Well, what, yeah. Why what right? makes this? They're advocating what makes it so easy to to misconstrue this 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 section two thirty because so many people are getting it wrong and don't quite understand it. Is it the language or what? What is it? Because I, nobody seems to get this right. 
Yeah, I, I I wish I knew, right? There, like I kind of wish I could go into some of the, the the brains of the people who are misconstruing it because some are doing it deliberately. Um, you know, some I think are, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people just think that this is the way it should be, um, and and they don't bother to read the law and they assume that the law was put in place for a certain reason or somebody you know said that the law should be this way for a certain reason and then people have just run with it, um, and it's really strange because certainly among politicians they know what the law says and they're just deliberately misrepresenting it and so you have a bunch of senators mainly who have yeah. uh, you know gone out of the way to to misrepresent what the law says uh, and then what's funny of course is now they're introducing all these bills to try and turn the law into what they said it already said um, which <laughs> should sort of indicate that they know that they were being misleading before like what drives me crazy is that there are media lawyers, media executives, and editors who still get it wrong, who yes. think that if they, because uh, they, they, they go to the pro, what section do they fixed, uh, they think that it's prior to that, and they think that if they moderate any public comment and miss something, they are more liable than if they didn't, which is exactly what they was there to fix, uh, was to give right. people both the sword and the shield. And to this day, to this day, I see people in the media industry who are so ignorant of their own business and the law around it that they still yeah. say, oh, no, 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 I can't moderate anything because that'll make me more liable. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I agree, and I make fun of those people all the time. I'm going to do a very, very narrow bit of defense uh, for, for some of those people because I, I, you know, um, I think the first time I really saw it pointed out uh, you know, as directly incorrectly uh, as this was actually in a Wired piece about Facebook about four years ago or something. It was like the cover story about Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and twice in that article, they say that Facebook decided that they would not do any moderation because if they did, they would lose 230, which is, again, is the exact opposite of what the law says. Right. The law says you can moderate and you're not liable for it. And I like called out the Wired reporters for, for, for saying it. Um, and, and, and sort of the, what, what I heard back, um, secondhand, not directly from the Wired reporters, but also from some people at Facebook was effectively like, yes, we know that the law actually says the opposite of that, but that law is only for the U S and because as Facebook, we wanted to put in place some sort of concept or a set of rules that applied beyond just the US, the easiest thing to do was to say, don't moderate because then you could be liable. And and somehow that got morphed into the idea that that is what the law said, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. the, point. you know, and, and I can understand like, if you're trying to come up with some sort of set of global rules, you can't rely on the language of 230. But that's, that's not a good defense of it, but that's no. kind of where I think some of that came. This morning on Morning Joe, as as my blood pressure goes sky high when I see the moral panic coming, um, he honest to God said, the, the Washington Post doesn't put in Nazis. Why should you? Yeah. You should be liable for putting in Nazis. Uh, thinking that, and this is, by the way, Joe Scarborough is the guy who can't edit himself because he goes on for 20 minutes asking one question. <laughs> um, imagine two billion Joe Scarboroughs and you've got to edit all of them. It's, it's absurd, and there's no respect for or understanding of the value of the public conversation. That's what bothers me most. Yeah, and, and I mean, the sort of related issue to that is that what he's really mad at is the First Amendment and not Section 230, right? Yep. Because, yep. yeah, the yep. wa Washington Post doesn't have, you know, Nazis, but then again, you know, sometimes the New York Times op uh, opinion section seems to be willing <laughs> to, to, to publish. Yeah. Them. Uh, yeah. But, but, but <laughs> it... Uh, but it's it's the First Amendment that allows that. I mean, like you can say, you know, Nazi supportive things. That is that is legal. It's it's you know hideous and, and uh, disgusting, but it is allowed under the First Amendment. It is the First Amendment that protects that. And I think a lot of people confuse that. And then if you know we get back to the the media getting it wrong, right? The New York Times seems to get the two thirty issue wrong all the time. Oh. And they had that you know that one giant headline once that said you know the law that allows for hate speech online and and blame 230. And then they had to write a, a tiny little correction that said, oh, actually, it's the First Amendment, which is, you know, kind of kind of a big mistake <laughs> because, you know, you can change 230 and there are all these bills around to try and change 230. But changing the First Amendment is a slightly bigger process. And I don't think anyone's really trying to do that right now. 
Speaking of changes, the Earn It Act uh, was marked up uh, today and changed, or this, I guess it was today. And it's, yeah, they, re they released the new bill today. They'll mark it up tomorrow. Okay. And proposed a change that eliminates the teeth, which I guess is a victory in some degree. For people who haven't been following the story, the Earn It uh, uh, Act is uh, a creation of Lindsey Graham and uh, Richard Blumenthal, which is kind of a right there, a marriage made in hell. Uh, and they wanted to, it, some see it as a kind of a covert way to undermine encryption. They may not need it anymore now that there's a absolutely overt uh, uh, proposal to undermine encryption. But the idea was if you if you don't follow, quote, best practices, uh, you could lose your Section 230 protection. They've... Mike, if I'm reading this right, they seem to have eliminated that you might lose your Section 230 protection. Yeah, the the Earn It Act is no longer about earning. You earn anything. nothing, <laughs> <laughs> right? They they pulled it out, but they kept the name, uh, and and they kept they kept this commission, right? The idea behind the original bill was that you'd have this commission, which you know was designed so that they could pretend it was a balanced commission, but it really wasn't. Uh, and the attorney general was able to put his hand on the scale entirely and say, like, this is what platforms have to do, and if that includes getting rid of encryption, then that would that would be one of the items. Um, and so now they, they still have the commission and the weird sort of, you know, pretend balance of the commission. Um, but then there's nothing like they'll come out with a set of best practices that nobody has to follow. And there's no legal penalty if you don't follow it. Um, so they, they pulled that part out of the bill. It's possible though that if the if the bill became law and this commission comes out and they do set up a bunch of best practices, I could see Congress coming back and then later trying to put those best practices into the law in some way. Um, but but. It's not. And so the only thing that's really in the bill now that changes the law is that they add a new section to 230 that says that uh, what is now referred to as CSAM, child sexual abuse material, uh, is no longer covered by Section 230. I like, which, your, I like your line, the artist formerly known as child porn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the fun things of the bill, actually, if you go through the end of the, 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 uh, the amendment that was put out today is that, uh, it goes through everywhere in the federal register that says child pornography and says, replace that with CSA. Oh, Lord. So it just over and over, there's like four pages of like, Oh, we have child pornography in the law here and here and here and here. And now just like cross it out, put in CSAM instead. So yes, that's the new, the new term because child pornography is no longer uh, allowed. I mean, that sounds bad. The way <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you also make an excellent case, which is that it, big tech seems to be taking the rap for child sexual abuse yeah. material as opposed to the creators thereof. Like, it's yeah. all your fault and fix it, big tech. Uh, in fact, Ron Wyden, uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize this, but again, this is what we learned reading Tech Dirt, uh, has a little uh, known uh, proposal to uh, to encourage enforcement of child protection laws in lieu of going after big tech here. Yeah. And, and yeah, for some reason, his bill didn't get very much attention. I saw he just put out a statement about the new Earn It Act saying that it's it's a problem. And, and again, you know, pointing to his alternative, which is basically saying like, Enforce you know, the, the damn real laws. Right. Like the real problem is that the law enforcement, the DOJ and others are not enforcing it. And if you look through the details, like the DOJ actually was required by Congress to to uh, and, and has been allocated a whole bunch of money uh, to go after, um, you know, people who are engaged in in, in CSAM, which is the, you know, uh, the, the correct term now. Um and they haven't done it. And they're supposed to put out a report like every couple of years or something. I forget the exact details. And they haven't done it. Like they literally have just ignored Jeez. what Congress told them to do and what Congress allocated for them. And then they blame, uh, you know, the, the, the different tech companies. And, it, you know, it, the sort of related issue to all of this is that, you know, the tech companies effectively all got together uh, and put together this voluntary system where they are reporting all of the different, you know, when they come across any kind of, uh, of this content, they're reporting it to NICMEC, uh, which you know the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they put together this amazing system that allows them to to share the content with the other platforms in, in a hashed form. You know, they're not sending around this material, but in a hashed form, so they can identify it and block it and stop it. And it's you know it's an incredible um, you know voluntary initiative that they've put together, and that's actually being leveraged against them 
you know, the the reason this bill came about in the first place was because there were these reports about how much content, how much of these, you know, uh, uh, sending to the database these platforms have done. So yes, like Facebook has identified a whole bunch of really, really awful content and they are reporting it and helping to make sure that that gets blocked across the internet and not just on Facebook and they're being blamed for it. And so, you know, this bill, again, it's, it's targeting the wrong thing. It's not targeting the actual it's, problem. It's kind of like and blaming, any, so the, it, blaming the testing for the coronavirus. It, it, <laughs> it, doesn't like, it doesn't sound fair at all. If, if, the big tech companies are actually trying to say, hey, exactly these, people, right. these are bad actors right. or what have yeah, you. And exactly right. They're not necessarily harboring it on their platforms. They're just saying, hey, we found well, some they people revealed trying to how use much us. They revealed how much there is. Right. And that scared right. everybody. But I it's, think that points to know, an underlying – there's an underlying – thing going on here that a lot of this is just theater that it is yeah. it's a convenient political weapon that can be wielded against big tech uh pri by the right primarily um you know it's, it's their fault it's their fault it's, it's their fault well but no but no it's not just the right too it's it's yeah it's uh, not the right joe biden is joe biden's going against 230 appeal of 230 yep it's just driving me nuts i know people who tried to get into the campaign and say stop stop <laughs> um yeah it, it's yeah. This one, this issue is not just the right. It's and no, it's, Dick you know, Blumenthal's a Democrat, absolutely right. Yep. And there, there are other Democrats who are supporting it as well. And you know, the more you look, the 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 deeper you look behind it, you realize like the lobbyists who are actually working for it are basically like the who's who of of the big internet company enemies. So like there are Hollywood lobbyists who are pushing this bill very heavily. Uh, and so like the joke that somebody made and um, I, I forget who told it to me, so I, I should give credit for it and I, I won't, but like uh, <laughs> was saying that like, you know, Hollywood might want to think twice, you know, especially as like more and more people from Hollywood are being accused of, of yeah. uh, various uh, not such good behavior uh, and of promoting certain things like, you know, so someone said, you know, if if uh, a Hollywood production has somebody who is, you know, credibly <laughs> accused of uh, uh, you know, uh, being a predator of some kind, like maybe they should lose the copyright on those films because that's basically what the, the structure of the Earn It oh. Act was. Um, and so, <laughs> or, or, or you have like, uh, some telco companies have been lobbying for this just as a way to kind of, you know, take a, a stick to the internet companies that they feel are taking their money. And then the other, the other batch of lobbyists, uh, which I find funny are sort of the old school tech companies uh, the ones who missed the boat being, you know, Oracle and IBM, uh, who yep, have yep. also been lobbying for, for getting rid of 230 because they don't rely on 230 because their business, because they picked the wrong business model. There yeah. is genuine anti-encryption sentiment, and that's kind of come forth now. Graham Blackburn and Cotton have both, have mm -hmm. uh, are sponsoring this so-called, so-called, it's very clear, Lawful yeah. Access to Encrypted Data Act, which essentially... Uh, ins insist that law, law enforcement should have plain text of any encrypted data uh, without saying exactly uh, how it's to be done. Uh, is, is, I wonder if that's one of the reasons the Earn It Act lost its teeth. They don't need it anymore now that they've got the Lawful Access um, Act. It, 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 there's been this weird discussion where some people are sort of making that claim. I think it, it is related to that. Like, I think they put together this bill in part because they knew they had to do something to sort of... Um, claim that there was no encryption issue with the with the earn it act there is still a little bit of of worry about how encryption could sneak back into the earn it um this the the laed uh bill probably has no chance of passing um but the the funniest the funniest thing i saw was uh i got a, a press release when when that bill came out i got a press release from this group um and i'm blanking on their name but the it's uh, it's uh, an advocacy group that's been around forever that advocates against porn just in general. Like they think porn is evil um, and they think it should all be completely blocked on, on the Internet. Um, and they sent out a thing praising this new bill because they said it proves that – the Earn It Act is not about encryption because this <laughs> bill is about encryption and therefore we should pass both of them, which doesn't Jeez. make any sense. Good it is Lord, not man. consistent in any way, shape or form. But um, it's, it's I mean, there's just so much, so much nonsense. Um, and I just feel like, you know, every two days or something, somebody 
produces a bill that you know doesn't understand how technology or the internet works at all or why any of this stuff is important and it just seems somewhat performative to say like we're standing up to, right. to these big internet companies yeah and it's not purely performative it's it, you know we're four months away from an election uh, yes it, it's really if it's performance it's performance with the goal of impressing the voters if nothing else sure so mike you, i want to pass I, I yeah, graham yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yes sir <laughs> <laughs> um I mentioned this on the show last week, so I won't bore folks again, Mike, but I want to send you. I, I'm par I was part of a, uh, this will take two minutes, Transatlantic High Level Working Group for Content Moderation and Freedom of Expression. That's the end of it. Um, <laughs> which which proposes a different, uh, more flexible framework for accountability and transparency instead of the kind of regulation we have and the hate speech laws and stuff. So I'll send it to you because I think you'll find it interesting. Yeah, I want to, I'd actually, we're going to take a break, but I would love to talk a little bit because uh, really all of these laws would impact American, you know, our That's American the European laws. part, right? But, but what? But there is a global issue. Uh, you know, yeah. you you've got on Tector. Brazil has proposed a fake news law that says, you know, internet users are guilty until proven innocent. Dis demands constant logging from ISPs. So there's a global issue uh, for sure going. In, in on. Europe, just there was just a report out in Europe. I think last week, like you probably know better than yep. I do, uh, that said that basically was envious of China. <laughs> that, 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 yeah. that purposely oh, said, they know yeah. how to said, do it, don't they? China's yeah. doing it right. They know how to do it, man. We, uh, not yeah. only they they clobber COVID, but they know how to keep a lid on these big <laughs> tech it, companies. It was, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a report prepared for the European right. Parliament by an outside group. So there were there are questions. It wasn't necessarily the European Parliament right. endorsing it, but it was oh. a, a like, hey, that great firewall, what an idea! Yeah, well, that really <laughs> works. It, is, it didn't that get really hooted works. off the continent. It's just frightening. Yeah. yeah. Let's take you a little break. It's so good to have you. Mike bridges. Masnick from techdirt.com, oh, Ant Pruitt from Hands On Photography, Jeff Jarvis from the Craig Newmark, et cetera. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> our, sh our show today uh, brought to you by Wasabi. Not the hot stuff you get with your sushi, but it is hot stuff. It's hot cloud storage, the perfect solution for anyone who is generating terabytes of data weekly and is and going out and buying more storage all the time wasabi is the is your is your savior it's it's better than on-prem storage it's more secure than on-prem storage and uh, they have quite a bit of capacity they're they're ready and willing to help you with your capacity issues wasabi is 80 percent cheaper than amazon's s3 it's significantly cheaper uh, it's also, frankly, cheaper than on-prem storage. Typically, you could store data in the cloud at Wasabi for less than just the maintenance fees, just the maintenance fees on the same amount of on-prem storage. And, you know, people, I think maybe the argument is, yeah, but we don't control it. It's, you know, it's out there in the cloud somewhere. Let me tell you, it's safer in the cloud than it would be uh, in your server closet. Uh, 11 nines of durability. That's one file every 649,000 years. You're not even going to lose that because they do integrity checking every 90 days on every file on Wasabi. They're hosted in redundant premier tier four data center facilities, highly secure. Uh, you, and, the, and the other thing is your data is secure by default, encrypted, always at rest, even if you don't specify encryption. They have access control mechanisms, things like bucket policies and ACLs, so you can grant permissions uh, to people who have need access and prevent people who don't from getting stuff. They, you can even, I love this part, designate data as immutable. It cannot be changed. It cannot be erased or altered, protecting you not only uh, from the ransomware guy waiting to jump, but also from yourself, from fumble-fingered employees. Uh, HIPAA-compliant, FINRA-compliant, CJIS-compliant. This is the way you want to store the data. And did I mention 80% cheaper than Amazon S3 and up to six times faster? Plus, you know, things like they don't charge for egress. You know, I, you know I, that hits me every time. You know, i got to transfer something off of S3 and say, well, that'll, that'll cost you. There's no, they don't have those complex storage tiers, no API requests, just a, no charge for API requests. Oh, yes, by the way, they support the S3 API, so you already have tools that work with it. It is really a great solution. If you're a managed service provider and you're selling storage, you can actually, you'll love this. You can earn more and charge less. Everybody 
is happy. Now, there's two ways to pay. There's pay-as-you-go, flat rate, $5.99 a month for a terabyte. Or uh, if, if you know that you're going to be using a certain amount of data, you can get the reserve capacity storage. You buy cloud storage, kind of like you'd buy on-prem storage. You say, all right, uh, I'm going to purchase this amount of cloud storage in a one, three, or five-year increment. You get bigger discounts for both longer terms and greater capacity. And you, it's locked in. You know how much it's going to cost. That's another thing. I'm, I'm trying to knock down all the pins, all the reasons people say, no, no, we have to have, we have to buy another SAN. No, we have to do that. No, you don't. You need Wasabi. It's just great. You just pour your data up to the cloud. Boom. You're done. Calculate the savings for yourself. Start a free trial of storage for a month. See what it's like. Go to Wasabi.com. You know what? Try all your S3 tools on it. See if it's faster. We know it's less expensive. Click the free trial link at wasabi.com and use the offer code TWIT. Then join the movement. Migrate your data to the cloud with confidence. W-A-S-A-B-I. The offer code is T-W-I-T. -I, I am a fan. As you know, I'm friends with the, the founder, David Friend, and uh, I just, this is a great service. Wasabi, W-A-S-A-B-I.com. Offer code is TWIT. Uh, back we go to our show. This has been a Can big I tell you week. a story from the past. Please, Mr. J. So Mike reminded me of it. Um, the, the, the protectionism that occurs uh, in the industries uh, that are threatened by this. I'm just trying to find it right now. Um, so in my in my research on Gutenberg, I have just reread the book Media at War, 1995 by Gwyneth Jackaway. It's an academic book. It's about radio at war or newspapers at war with radio, actually, to put it properly. And, and and I remember a couple of things they did. Have you ever, did you ever hear of the Biltmore Agreement, Mr. No, Radio? No. So in 1933, when newspapers were fearing that that uh, this radio thing was going to come in and they were going to have news on it, and f that, we don't want that. That's they can't do it well. They're they're all idiots, and we are the only ones who have any hold on truth. Think about it. This was the first real competitor to the medium of print, radio. So they 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 went after them. And they, they had an, a meeting at the Biltmore, which they agreed that CBS and NBC would abandon news gathering. They would be forced to pay for news coming from three wire services. Uh, they, they would not uh, be allowed to put any uh, advertisements on anything related to news. They'd be limited to news bulletins of five minutes. And their commentators were prohibited from discussing news less than 12 hours old. <laughs> so uh, this is what the newspaper industry this attempted to do. It lasted until 1938, but petered out because some newspapers owned radio stations and didn't like it. And the wire services wanted to sell to the radio stations, and so they didn't like it. So it went away. The newspapers tried other tactics, right? They threatened to stop printing radio schedules, you know, like TV listings <laughs> in their papers. But the readers hated that, so they said, F you, we want the radio schedules. They had to do that. They lobbied to have radio regulated, but this is really cool. They lobbied to have radio regulated by the federal government, as indeed occurred. And then they said that any companies that are regulated by the federal government should not be allowed to cover Congress and shouldn't be allowed oh into the press gallery. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, wonderful God. little – yeah, isn't that great? Um, <laughs> They uh, they blamed radio for taking advertising revenue from them, but the depression is probably what killed more more newspapers. And uh, as Jackaway said, it was all cloaked in a self important sacred rhetoric. And we're the ones to give you the news. We understand what's what. Um, they Wait, also this, feared this that this sound familiar. It's amazing. It, exactly. It's all. It's all yeah. exactly right. They said that the radio, through the magic inherent in the human voice, I'm quoting here from a book called Propaganda of the News, has means of appealing to the lower nerve centers and creating emotions, <laughs> which they hear mistakes for thoughts. Radio is just showbiz, they said. We're the, the voice sense of in hearing, your head. <laughs> the sense of hearing does not satisfy the same intellectual craving as the sense of reading. Oh, right. um, yeah. Most folks are eye-minded, <laughs> oh, uh, so oh, they, they uh, uh, yeah, but but it's exactly, exactly yeah. parallel today, right? People, uh, radio is crap. People are, it's filled with crap. People are too stupid to realize it. They're going to be uh, affected by it. We have to clean it up. We have to stop it from happening. Um, when was, what year was that? 1933 is when it started and it ran for quite some time. Because, I mean, uh, you, you, if you think about it, uh, in a way, that's exactly what Joseph Goebbels did 
with radio in Nazi Germany. I mean, well, so, so the argument the argument was that radio was going to be used, but also I would think that that um, but FDR also used it, right? That's FDR true, right? Fireside chats. wanted the New yep. Deal, yep. and most newspapers at the time were Republican and opposed the New Deal. So he said, "F them! I'm going to go around them and do fireside chats." Uh, yeah. Right, and so, and it proved to be very. Are we effective. doomed? Are we doomed to repeat this cycle forever? <laughs> yes, on yes. and on and on. It happened again with uh, television. It happened again yep. with uh, telcos going, the R box going into news. Yep. Same exact thing happened. And there's this. I want to read a quote, if I may. Jack away, the author from um, an actual academic, unlike me. Um, <laughs> oh, where the hell did I put it now? Um, I'm sorry, I messed this up. Having been presented with a new technology, contemporary actors voice their concerns about how the new medium will change their lives and in doing so reveal their vulnerabilities. In their hopes of technological deliverance is reflected the ways in which the current lives fall short. In their fears of technological danger can be heard what they hold sacred and are most afraid of losing. Listening to fears about the impact of new media is much like interpreting dreams. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> These are the collective nightmares of yeah. people or an institution about yeah. the potential dangers of changing the familiar media ecology. That Beautifully so said. And she wrote this book in 95. Uh, she wrote this, but she had to have finished it before the web. Yeah, before the internet. Yeah. So she off. didn't see any of that coming. Yeah. And, and the parallels are just magnificent. Yeah. Yeah, mm. history Thank has a way of little... echoing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Always does. It's kind of yeah. depressing, actually. I feel like. Yes. <laughs> we never. Well, I'm just going to stay it, in my four walls. Yeah. It's safer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I, I think it leads to the people who know the history to. Uh, That's right. Into uh, uh, a habit of of screaming at people. <laughs> Thank God Jeff Jarvis reads the old books. Well, so no, I'm not reading it. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so this was uh, the week for cancel culture. Uh, I could just go through all the people who have been banned or <laughs> blocked or kicked from YouTube and Facebook. And it's funny because this is the this is the the back and forth, the reaction, and then the reaction, and even Parler <laughs> had to start banning. Oh man! Even Parler had to start banning people. Oh, well, Parler! Parler is the last bastion of freedom of expression. Yeah. No. How could wow. this happen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually created a Parler account. I was mortified because when you first create an account, it immediately tweets on your behalf, whatever you call it. It immediately says, oh, Leo's on Parler, everybody. Oh, it's like, no. shh, shh, shh. Yeah. <laughs> So just a word of warning when you first sign up, sign up with a... Uh, uh, I deleted a, that a, post a, a second. Dummy, it a dummy up name. Up. Oh, man, how embarrassing. And then apparently they're offering Parler, which has been around for a couple of years. It's a Twitter, com you know, clone, basically, a competitor, uh, and was discovered just uh, recently uh, by members of the Republican Party uh, and the Trump campaign um, and has been, you know, touted as the, a bastion of free speech, safe from the cancel culture. Um, and, and, of course, you're immediately offered when you join uh, – a array of right-wing news organizations like Breitbart. Breitbart. Yeah. That was the first thing so I you, saw. So you kind of know <laughs> maybe they don't mind that so much, uh, although they're at great pains to say, look, look, no, 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 we have no political point of view. We just, we're just, you know, we're just here doing our job. Um, they they did offer, I think they first offered 20000 and up to 30000 to a to any liberal pundit who was willing to come on <laughs> and be a, a target boy. Uh, on the uh, site, I don't know if they've awarded that money or not, but now they're off actually uh, starting to uh, starting to ban accounts already. So, yeah, they they. Uh, what's funny though is they they sort of keep changing the reasons why they're banning accounts, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and then everybody's trying. All the the fans and supporters of Parler are trying to justify it, and and I keep trying to point out that like the reasons that they say it's okay for Parler to do it are the same reasons why. All these other companies, Twitter and Reddit and YouTube and Twitch are, are banning people. They have rules. People violate the rules. And so then you get you get in trouble for it. And that's the same exact reason that Parler is giving. And, you know, I just I find it hilarious that Parler claim that that, you know, oh, yeah, we, we're only the only content moderation we do is based on the FCC, which doesn't apply to the Internet. Uh, nope. And 
uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States and, <laughs> and their, their community Which is guidelines. All I know porn when I see it. <laughs> right, right. But, but the, the funniest thing is like if you, you read through their, their entire community guidelines, and I said this uh, in my post, like it feels like, you know, some 20 something tech guy went to like the Wikipedia right. page for exceptions yeah, to the first I love that, Mike. Co copied the headings and then just put in what they think it all means, which has nothing to do with like the actual, you know, uh, uh, you know, very clearly laid out limits to to the First Amendment, uh, which, you know, involve lengthy trials and, and careful analysis. And yet Parler's just like, you know, no, no, we're going we're going to follow those rules, uh, except if you uh, have a, a username that we find offensive, then then we'll kick you off. <laughs> it's like that's not that's not against the First Amendment, <laughs> right? You know, so. it's, these are hard. These are really hard, uh, thorny issues. Although Parler did something right that maybe these other guys uh, should do. Neil I. Patel called it the reverse two thirty clause, where you're <laughs> you're you're on the hook for Parler's yeah. legal expenses if they get sued. And uh, as you point out, Mike, I bet Ted Cruz will start supporting Section two thirty once he realizes. He's going to be paying <laughs> if Parler gets sued. That's yeah. I mean, w one of the points I made, like a lot of people called out the the uh, that indemnity clause. Um, you know, the thing is, like that indemnity clause is actually in a lot of different uh, social media sites, uh, and or, or used to be. I saw a few of them have pulled it. I think Twitter used to have it and pulled it. I think Twitch did the same. Um, but um, YouTube still has a very similar. Uh, indemnity clause. But the thing is, it never matters because of Section 230. Right. The only reason that right. would come into play is if you didn't have Section 230 yes. and the legal fees might actually, you know, be substantial and might actually matter and a platform might want to shift those over. But it's funny because, you know, Ted Cruz has been one of the, the most vocal opponents of Section 230 and the one of the most vocal misrepresenters of 230. And yet and here he is now being like the most vocal supporter of Parler. Uh, and I and I honestly think that, you know, if 230 went away and he realized what legal liability he had just put on himself, he might rethink that stance if if that is he were intellectually honest. Well, that's what I, I that what makes me wonder if all of this is not just grandstanding and, you know, yeah. that's not it, it has no nobody's going to do anything. So it is the season. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> white supremacists David mm -hmm. Duke and Richard Spencer banned uh, from YouTube. Um Let's see. Facebook. Uh, I'm sorry. Reddit killed a uh, number. I think several uh, thousand, as I remember. Um, About two thousand. Two thousand subreddits, including the Donald, and now, what uh, all was in them. Chapo. Jesus. Uh, now, the the whole David Duke thing on YouTube that that made me scratch my head a little bit. Now. I'll be the first to tell you, I never went to look up his YouTube channel, so I don't know what was on there. <laughs> you're no fan Obviously. of the Grand Dragon, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Clearly. But it made me wonder, you know, after seeing that, uh, like, what content was being displayed and knowing that it's David Duke, how much content was it? Was it just two videos? Was it 100 videos? How long have they been there? And if it's been more than a week, what the hell took YouTube so long? Well, I, I, yeah, um, I, I, I don't think there's any defense of keeping that necessarily up. I think, you know, YouTube stands for the longest time was that they, you know, they didn't want to be accused of bias, right? Uh, and this was this is the whole thing why so many different different sites have sort of tiptoed around this is because as soon as they uh, enforce the rules in a way that that happens to impact a uh, Republican or, or supporter of Trump, suddenly they're accused of bias, even if they actually are treating other others equally. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of these platforms have really, really tiptoed around these things. And YouTube was definitely one of them. And they basically said, well, if it's not directly violating our policies, then we're going to leave it, even if even if it is, you know, horrible and awful. And eventually they said, you know, okay, we have to, we have to adjust our policies even further. So but there's, a, is, there's a big, okay. there's a big uh, balance beam, which is going to yeah. cause me greater pain. Yes, and right, uh, right. is it going to cause me greater pain to piss off Donald Trump? Or is it going to cause me greater pain to piss off Black Lives Matter? And the scale has shifted. Mm. So yeah. now and, YouTube and acts. So I, I mean, I would hypothetical. say it's, it's, Go ahead. Uh, a hypothetical would be uh, David Duke was was clever about the content that that he and his team produced, where it didn't necessarily come off as hate speech. Is that the argument? Uh, it 
No. <laughs> I don't, I'm I don't, curious. I, mean, I don't think they I, feel any need to justify it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think that so, is, so that goes back to my yeah. first question. What took so long? Right. I, 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 you know? I think, well, I do think it is part of it. They, they actually were somewhat careful. And if you, not that I spent much time uh, paying attention to, to his YouTube feed or, or the related YouTube feeds either, but they actually do tiptoe themselves a little bit um, to try and present it in, uh, you know, sort of a buttoned up light, their, their, their horrible viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, you know, it goes beyond that scale. Uh, you know, the, the scale suggests there's sort of like two sides to this. And I think it's, it, it is a lot more complicated than that. And that, you know, one of the things that I keep trying to point out to people is that every content moderation decision involves trade-offs, and it's not just one or the other. It, it involves a whole long list of, of trade-offs. And you go through the list of options that you have, and every one of them is bad. And, and that's a problem that I think people don't yes. quite get. They assume that there's like this obvious answer that if we just do this, and we just get rid of this, then, then we've solved everything. And yet the, the real thing that happens is, you know, every one of these has some issue that you know, will come back to bite you no matter what choice you make. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's this, you know, the people who are doing this job, it puts them in this impossible position where they're trying to balance so many different interests and no matter what choice they make is, is not going to work in some way is going to cause some other problem. And, and I don't know, you know, frankly, how, how people can do that job when they know that every decision they make is, is a bad one and they only have bad choices, including doing nothing, but that is one of the choices. Yep. And so often so Mike, when you, when you just right, have bad sorry. choices in front of you, doing nothing is seems like the, the best choice. Mm. So so I, I just got a telegram, Mike. You're hired tomorrow <laughs> by Zuckerberg <laughs> at huge money. Oh, don't fall for it, Mike. He does this to us every week. Don't fall for it. <laughs> Go ahead. What what do you what what do you, what do you what do you what should Facebook do? What uh, having just laid out the Gordian knot that is Facebook, what do you what do you what would you do? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I wrote a paper last year, um, that lays out what I think these sites should do, um, that they probably will not do, but what I think they should do is effectively take themselves out of this business, but enable everybody else to be in that business. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is that they should restructure things so that they are not uh, a silo that controls everything where they have to make all of the decisions, but they effectively open up their platform so that anyone can build an implementation, can build their own Facebook or could build mm -hmm. their own Facebook oh. filters and allow anyone to come in and make those decisions and then allow anyone to adjust those or to make their own decisions and sort of go back to what was the sort of promise of the early internet of, you know, pushing the power out to the ends of the network. Let, and it, say, let a okay, million parlors bloom. But, exactly. But, how, but, allow, but the, allow, them, allow them to communicate with each other. Federate. And, and, and it, it could be federated. It could be there, there's all different ways that you could do it. But you can put in place some ways of doing that where there are incentives for, for better overall behavior. And the, the, the analogy that I use, and it's not a perfect analogy and you can criticize it, but the analogy that I use is email, where email, you know, for the most part is based on these open protocols, SMTP or uh, IMAP and, and, and whatnot. And Anyone can build their own implementation of it. Anyone can put together an email server or you have companies that come in and, and offer it. And obviously you have Gmail being the, you know, probably the biggest provider of email out there. But Google is actually incented not to be awful with, with Gmail because if you don't like what they're doing or you don't feel safe using their product, it's very easy to switch to some other email provider. And when you switch, you don't lose access to everybody. You can still communicate with your entire uh, book. You can export your your all of your email uh, people can always reach you or you can set up things in different ways you can have a gmail address but use a different client or you can have a different email address that is not gmail and use gmail as your client like you can mix and match and and you can mm -hmm. you know add in different filters and different tools and different people can build different things to go on top of it and you have this structure that allows for a lot more experimentation a lot more competition and a lot more incentive for good behavior while pushing the power out to the ends and not just relying on one central source to control everything and if you don't like it you're you're stuck what's the like I, I think you just what's the business incentive to do that though basically you're getting you're saying and give up 
Well, I mean, I, I think Google's pretty happy with Gmail and, and what they've gotten out of it. It might not have the same margins as yeah, but, other parts of but their this, business. But that protocol existed before Google invented Gmail. Sure. Right? Yes, so it's not I like understand. Google invented email and then said, hey, why don't you all do it too? And, and, and so I think, well, I, I, I think you're right. Like there is some something that has to give in that. But part of my argument is that the cost of continuing to well, control right. everything gets higher and we higher. we got to make the pain and, so high that they finally and say, it's, well. It's it's getting there. And I also think that there are some potential interesting other business models. Uh, and, you know, the one that gets the most attention, and I'm not endorsing this because everybody gets mad at me if I, if I, well, either way. Uh, no one is going like, to get mad at you here, Mike. <laughs> well, maybe Jeff uh, will. Watch it, Mike. It, watch it. it, it, it well, I, I will pre-roll my eyes and say there is the potential <laughs> of, of very – uh, with some of the like cryptocurrency possibilities to create business models around protocols that are different where the incentive is to have more people just using the protocol overall and not just sucking up everybody's data and making use of it. And so I think there's some potential there. I think there are a couple other business model ideas that could work as well. And like the only way we find out is if we allow for that experimentation to happen. Isn't isn't uh, at Jack um, before COVID? Wasn't he toying with that with the with the notion yeah, of an open platform was, and yeah. building on top so again? Right. The, yeah. So he and and he he credited my paper, which was a little bit scary. Nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> in 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 and helping him make that decision, uh, he read some other stuff too. It's not it's not all my fault. Uh, and I know that that it, uh, I you know I know that that Twitter folks are still exploring that, and they've they've reached out to a bunch of people, and I know that people are kind of working on like how would that look. Uh, and the you know the one thing that I've the deeper you go into this and the more discussions you have is that again, like everything else, you start to go down different paths for like, how, how would this work and how, how could this look? And, and no matter what path you go down, you do run into challenges and you run into hurdles and it's not clear what will work. And, and if you go through the thought process of saying like, well, what if we, we set this up sooner or later, you're going to, to come across a situation where you say, well, what happens when, you know, whatever the Nazis take over this part of, of the world, you know, and, 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 it, it will create challenges. And I know that like on the, the content moderation question, you know, there are some people out there who say like, oh, you know, they embrace my paper more than I do. <laughs> and they're like, well, this will solve all of the content moderation problems. And I'm saying, no, like no matter what, you're still going to have content moderation questions. Um, but I think that this approach allows for more experimentation and somebody who's probably a lot smarter than I am will actually figure it out by not just limiting it to, to you know, a few giant companies within a 50 mile radius of where I'm sitting right now. When, when, this all started it's a way to when this all started becoming a problem a couple of years ago, Cory Doctorow told uh, us, uh, this is where geeks have to step up and invent yes. 20 new Facebooks. I don't see fa any publicly held company saying, hey, you know what? <laughs> we got a new idea. We're just going to give away our intellectual property and let everybody do it. Uh, but I could see many people coming along and saying, well, we you know, we need to make a better one. I mean, in a way, isn't Parler a response to Twitter? And if there were, and it, so is Mastodon. Um, yeah. Is that, yeah. A, is and, that and viable, doing it that way? I, don't, I just don't see publicly held companies. All they're doing is trying to copy what was rather than trying to invent something new. I mean, I've been arguing that the that the, right. that the internet so far is made for speaking. No one's making it for listening. That, well, this so would there's, be there's this a new giving away we, This the, would do that. Giving away the Facebook platform or the Twitter platform would not create something new. It would just create more Facebooks yeah. and Twitter. Well, well, we don't know. It, 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 right, you don't know. It yeah. yeah, if you if you right. allow for the experimentation, you might begin to see some some really interesting things. The other thing that that you know Corey's argument is a little bit more nuanced than, than that even, and I and I agree with Corey on this one. I think that it is important. His argument is not just that you want people to create twenty Facebooks, but you want them to to without needing Facebook to say okay, you want them to be able to go in and suck out Facebook's data. Right, and so he he's trying to force the same kind of thing that I'm doing. But doing it without the permission of of those large no, companies. No, because there I, could be a legal framework to do that. You could see yes, you could see that be kind of almost an eminent domain. A government saying, "All right, that's our data. You got to let it free." Right, but right now the law is actually the opposite, and this is partly like Facebook's doing. Right, I mean they have have, <laughs> have filed cases. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they filed these. The, the big case that they did was uh, against this this company called Power.com that tried to right. build like a unified interface for all the different social media right. companies. This is about a decade ago, and so you could give Power your login, so it was authorized. 
But Facebook said that that was unauthorized access and it violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is, you know, uh, supposed to be about yeah. hacking. And yet yeah. the courts bought that Everyone. argument and the, yep. co the court said, yeah, that's right. So because of that, Facebook is able to block access uh, to to their service. And so that makes it much harder to build that what what Corey refers to as uh, adversarial interoperability, which I, love um, I, I, I also think is really important. It's a great phrase. Dan, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry, Anna, I interrupted you. Did you, did you? No, no. He said, I, I no. muted myself. Sorry. But no, I was just saying that's pretty much what we were saying last week about these extra uh, spinoffs, if you will, of, of different options for these social media platforms. That's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'd love to see it. Uh, I don't see it happening, but it'd yeah. be nice. I, where's your paper published, Mike? Uh, it was uh, through the uh, Knight Institute at Columbia. So and the the it's called protocols not platforms if you do a search on protocols not platforms yeah uh it should be the top result and it's it's uh at, at the knight institute uh at columbia very so. very sensible sweet what's your background like how did you start uh, uh to, 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 <laughs> how, did, how did you get to be so smart yeah <laughs> it's the first guy I've ever met who's as smart as Corey Doctorow can explain Corey to me. So I gr I'm very grateful. Yeah. Uh, my background is not that interesting. I, I, uh, I have a degree, uh, of all things, in industrial and labor relations. Nice. Uh, huh. And so if you want to know about labor disputes and the early history of unions, I'm your man. It shows you uh, have a high threshold for boring topics. So that's, that's, that's very right. useful. <laughs> I think. An unsolvable one. <laughs> yeah. Insoluble uh, problems. That's exactly right. Yeah. But yeah, but I, I just, you know, I have always had a, a real fascination with sort of technology and innovation and, uh, you know, subscribed to Wired from day one uh, and, and was sort of deep in, in that world. And, um, and I went to, to business school um, to get a, a you know one of those horrific MBA things um, with the intention of you know going to work in Silicon Valley and 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 working for an you know innovative company a, a startup and I I left business school and I went to one large company for a little while which was Intel uh, and saw how that uh, worked or didn't work uh, and then went to a startup. Uh, in the 90s and saw how that didn't work uh, and decided <laughs> I, was, I was having a lot more fun commenting and uh, thinking through the issues rather than actually having to to implement them at scale or dealing with venture capitalists and, and all of that kind of fun stuff. And then, you know, now have spent 20 some odd it's years amazing. just uh, talking about this stuff. It's really amazing. How many people are tech dirt? Is tech dirt? Uh, it also depends on how you count as with so many of right. these things, uh, <laughs> but we're, we're four full-time people and then we have some freelancers and contractors. So we're between four and eight, depending on how you count. And tech dirt is ad supported, but there's a Patreon page as well. You sell uh, gear and so forth. Tech dirt, uh, dot com. There's all sorts of ways. It's not to, called gear. It's called merch. Merch. Come on. Come on, Uncle Merch. Neil. I'm Ramp. sorry. I'm not good at this. <laughs> As you know, I'm not good at this. Um, nice. And he's even got a game, a, a card game. Yeah. CIA. Yeah, go get the card game. Collect it all. That was, that was uh, we, we've been doing, this is a, a bizarre thing that we've sort of come across recently, which is um, we've been making games. We're actually working on, this has not been released yet, but since it's relevant to the topic, we've been working on a game <laughs> that will... Uh, Turn the players into a trust and safety team for a fictional uh, uh, social media network, and oh, and and force people to make these decisions, <laughs> oh. and uh, and as I said, uh, then later regret whatever decision they make. So we, we, we had hoped to have that out a few months ago, and then you know the world kind of blew yeah. up. So there was, there was a Twitter to... string with Mike and Jeff Kosov and me. And they were saying we should make 230 the, the Broadway right. musical or something. And I said, uh, the board game. And and Mike said, oh, working on, on it. it. On it. On <laughs> it. Yeah. And Masnick's so, on it. Yep. So we should have that. But the, the, the game that is on there is uh, it's actually the CIA internally used board games for training. And they perhaps stupidly admitted that at South by Southwest. Uh, and so uh, someone filed a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, request. Oh, so you're not joking when you say this, yeah, this has been declassified. This is, you're not joking. A legitimate, honest-to-goodness, oh uh, declassified oh, CIA beautiful. training game. 
and they released it. And, and I know copyright law well enough to say if it is a product created we by the federal government, it. yeah. it's it's in the public domain. We can take it. It was heavily redacted. Uh, the design was not great. So we had to update the design and fill in a lot no. of the blanks of, of the secret stuff the CIA doesn't want us to know. Uh, and and wow. we turned it into a game and we put it on Kickstarter. And it's it's actually, you know, I, I would say, I will, I will admit, it is not the greatest game in the world. I think there are better games out there. The CIA is perhaps not the best <laughs> game development, uh, but it, it, it is a fun game. And it's it the does, most accurate game in the I world. If, that may, that, if that you're may looking for simulations for of <laughs> global, <laughs> global, uh, this is great. And here's your choice. Here's your chance to get it for 25% off. Oh God! I, I think we that code may not. We should have uh -oh. taken that down. I think the uh -oh. code ended. Uh, uh -oh. uh, it's July first now. Uh oh. Uh, Next day. If, if Who's trying to get the discount? Me, no, Who knew we would still be saying it's staying inside? Here we are, July first. Yeah. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> what a great idea. I think that's hysterical. Yes. I love that. It's a fun game. I mean, I actually do still play it. I play it with my kids. Is it like it or not. Risk They're, a little bit or, I mean, um, strategic? No, it's uh, it's less strategic than it should be. I'll tell you, like, when, when we started putting it together, we you know, we put it up on Kickstarter and we got all these backers and we said, you know, hey, look, we want to – and we were working with, like, an actual game developer who, who's developed a whole bunch of board games. And we said, look, we can make this game – better and a little bit more like a, a, a board game you would really like. And people are like, no, we want the original <laughs> CIA version. You know, that's the one they had. We want it as true to, to that as possible. Nerds. And so it's it's a training game. Like it's it's really designed to teach you about that's like all the different ways that the CIA can spy on you. Uh, <laughs> and and so it is it is educational, but it is it is fun. You're sort of it's a it's a there's there is strategy to it. You're basically trying to solve different world crises with different techniques to get information. And at the same time, you're trying to put, uh, uh, you know, hurdles in front of all of the other players. Wow. So there's there's legitimately a card called red tape. Like you can put red tape onto, <laughs> onto another player and slow them down. <laughs> I want red tape. That's hysterical. <laughs> now, is, is red tape classified as political, military, economic, or a weapon? I, I, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. oh, that's yeah. hysterical. That's yeah, really it sounds like it'd fun. be fun yet depressing all at the yes, same time. Yes, at the same time. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, Mike Masnick's here. So is Aunt Pruitt, Jeff Jarvis. Uh, Mike, you you know you noticed we haven't mentioned Google really yet. The show is called This Week in Google. So we do we pay lip service to the title by doing something we call the Google Change Log that's coming up. Uh, next, what's new at Google? But first, a word from our sponsor. You may have noticed we're here in the LastPass studios. That's because we're Ooh. big fans. Been using LastPass, I have personally, for more than a decade. Uh, Joe Segris joined us, uh, actually went and talked to uh, Steve Gibson of our Security Now show. Steve got to see all the source code. Helped Joe helped uh, him understand everything LastPass was doing. And Steve gave it his absolute seal of approval. He started using it. Uh, and then we started using it uh, in our business, too, because after all, it, you can have, you know, the best uh, operational security in the world. But if your employees don't, they're the weakest link. So especially now as employees are going home and they've got the keys to the kingdom, they've got passwords to your bank accounts, your databases, your customer records, everything. You need to keep that stuff safe and secure. Using LastPass in business has really made a difference. Your IT department has a big job. I mean, not only are people going home, but you've got more appliances, more devices, more applications, new threats, and new regulations. Strong security is not easy. Fortunately, LastPass is here to help your IT department with strong security that's easy to use and easy to manage. LastPass lets you secure every entry point from shadow IT to apps to mobile and cloud services, their access solutions give you visibility and control over every access point to your organization. And really, that is what you're going for here. Of course, it starts with you with uh, authentication, and that's really where LastPass sings. And it's more than just password management. Employees can access a variety of applications and devices. Uh, they can use single sign-on. 
Uh, of course, passwords with autofill. They also do authentication better than anybody else. Not only do they take advantage of the biometric authentication in modern smartphones, but they also do contextual authentication, things like geolocation and IP address. And, and LastPass Identity will give you a simple and integrated view across all access and authentication tests so you know who's accessing what, when, and where. And the best part about LastPass, the thing that's really kind of impressive to me, usually we think of uh, the trade-off between security and uh, convenience. LastPass can increase your security but will not impact productivity. In fact, employees, our employees love LastPass. They, they use it because it makes it easier for them. It autofills passwords. The, the single sign-on is so great. It's better than passwords and more convenient. Uh, they don't need to understand, you know, what's going on from our IT point of view. All they know is it's easier to do what they need to get done. Even sharing passwords, which is tough now that we're all working at home. LastPass makes securely, security effortless. Remember, your passwords are entryways into your business. Spreadsheets, sticky notes, or as one of our engineers did, public websites with your passwords, those are not secure. LastPass's password management secures it all, so you don't have to. Of course, strong encryption. LastPass works on every device you have. Uh, your vault is never decrypted anywhere but on device. Your password is never transmitted to LastPass. These are all the things you care about, and LastPass does it all right. Secure your business. Give your IT department the tools to keep your business safe, visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you and your business stay productive and secure no matter where your employees are. And many of them are home, as, 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 as Ant is. Lastpass.com slash twit. We thank them so much uh, for keeping the lights on here at the uh, studios. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lastpass. Lastpass dot com slash twit. Somebody in the chat room, Rocky Horror, is saying we should rename Twig to This Week in Leo's Gang. <laughs> this week in, <laughs> in gangs. What? No. Uh, this week in whatever. But, you know, Google kind of says it all, right? Because it's, you know, it's about the Google verse. It's about the world that we're all living in. What do you think about the, uh, the Facebook boycotts? Uh, certainly it, it's something to pay attention to. But I've seen many people say, you know what? Facebook makes most of its money on the long tail of small advertisers. They don't care, you know. The top 100 brands are only 6% of total Facebook advertising. Um, Mark's taking it seriously. He's meeting with the groups behind the boycott. Uh, they are, it seem to be even changing um, some of the things they do on Facebook. But this ad boycott, Jeff, this, this isn't really something Mark's worried about, is it? Um, I think there's a larger brand damage. And, you know, the problem I have... And full disclosure, as I raise money for my school from Facebook, I received nothing personally from any of the platforms, end of disclosure, um, is that Facebook is constantly trying to catch up with um, with moral questions. And that's just not good. He's got to get it. I keep on saying you know, they, they've got to have a North Star. They've got to have a strong view of what they do and do not want on Facebook and what it stands for and why it exists. But instead, it's just always somebody's after them and then they'll, oh, OK, if I do this, will you, will you stop yelling at me? Yeah, it's um, more reaction. It's more reaction it is. more than, than anything else. Move fast to break things. Been. It always has been, right? <laughs> That's their motto. Yeah. Yep. Nailed Mike, it. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I think it's interesting. I think it will have some impact. And I think that that they at least realize that like it's 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 really bad PR right now to have all these giant mm -hmm. companies basically saying that, that we're pulling out. You know, the 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 point that I that struck me as interesting is that, you know, going back to the argument about Section 230, one of the points that a lot of people, a lot of critics raise about 230 is that because the law, you know, gives, you know, blanket immunity to the to the platforms for not moderating, that they have no incentive to moderate. And I think that this is a really good example that that's not true, that there are other ways to have incentive. Yeah. It's not just the law. You know, if users are getting upset, that's incentive. If your advertisers are getting upset, that's incentive. If the, the media is turning against you, as it very much has in Facebook's case, that's incentive. And so I think this is another example of like the nature of 230, which allows for 
these changes to be made without having to go to a giant commission at the government and say, like, is this an OK best practice, uh, is that it, it allows for the platforms to change and, and ex experiment. And so I think that this is a good example of ways that different parties can, uh, you know, uh, apply pressure to Facebook, whether or not this one works. The fact that these kinds of things are out there is, is I think, a, a good sign. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It'll be interesting to see how much Facebook actually does change. Follow up question, Mike. What do you think of the specific demands of the group? Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm less impressed by them. I, I feel that they're mm -hmm. a little bit um, – that they don't necessarily take into account the reality of of the the difficult to impossible choices that Facebook yep. is trying yep. to make in all of these situations. So you know, I think they're a little bit unrealistic. Um, and I also think, you know, as a side note, a bunch of the companies I think that have pulled ads were probably uh, struggling in general because of the the pandemic that we're living through. And we're probably looking to decrease advertising and realize that this is a way to decrease advertising, but get good media Gets attention. The hook. <laughs> well, and not only that, but, but Unilever uh, said uh -huh. they're pulling ads on both Twitter and Facebook to the end of the year. What they're really doing is they don't want to be near any controversy. They don't, they, they hate being near news. They don't want to be near politics. Right. This is they're, they, they just basically said until the election's over, we're not going to be any, near any human beings. Right. And and we get good press coverage for it in the meantime, right. which sort of makes up for the loss of advertising. Perfect um, timing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can see that marketing guy coming in and say, hey, it's win win. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, I, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to see how these changes go take take place and sort of, you know, the, the different campaigns and, and public pressure is actually a, a pretty effective tool. Uh, you know, even when I don't agree with the, the overall aims. Um, you know, it's fascinating to see it in practice. The uh, NAACP, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, Color of Change have all uh, arranged to meet with Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg and Chris Cox. The returned, by the way, wow, the returned product officer at Facebook. Chris he, he, Cox, yeah. Yeah, he left like yeah. in a huff a, a year ago. And now, I, you know, I like it here after all. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> and they want Zuckerberg to be there. Um, Facebook says... Uh, yep, Mark's going to join, so he's going to meet with them. Uh, I think that's the least he can do is is at least listen to their concerns. Um, what are their concerns? Is this in person or or um, I'm virtual? virtual? I'm sure it's virtual. Why, I, mean, I hope it's virtual. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to all get together in a room. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so, what do they want? What 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 would? Well, oh, I mean, I know the what they again? I know what they're saying, but. But oh, what, I see. what would they really like Facebook to do? Hmm. To, to, to I don't get, think they know. Rid, well, I think you know this is this is the, this is the issue with like all of these questions around trust and safety and content moderation. They want uh, less of the bad stuff and more of the good stuff. <laughs> Whatever. And if, yeah. If if you ask them to define those things, it's a well, you should know it when you For see all it. All meanings of, of bad Bingo. stuff and good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the, the ADL is probably it. the clearest. The ADL says get rid of hate. Yeah, the ADL right. has a definition of hate. Unilever doesn't have an addition, a, a definition of hate. <laughs> right. And when when that which is defined as hate turns out to be the president of the United States and his party, well, that's getting, as Mike was saying, that gets to be pretty uncomfortable. Who would have thought I would have a headline here that says Twitch bans the president of the United States temporarily? <laughs> <laughs> that's like the world turned upside down, Right. Uh, you know, yes. and and I think the president was probably celebrating that moment too, just just for a few minutes. Proves his point. Like, you know what? He I made another Twitch. headline. Boom. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, and that was the first thing everybody's asked me is, well, what's what's President Trump doing on Twitch? What is he playing a game? <laughs> what is it? Maybe he's playing that CIA game. I don't know. But no, I think <laughs> president is PewDiePie. I think that uh, yeah, PewDiePie. I think honestly. Uh, and this is hard to say. I think it's a sh it's kind of shameful. I mean, the president of the United States needs a has I think has the right to reach out to the American people. Uh, it's just like I think it's shameful when the networks refuse uh, any president uh, time to speak. But it's these days. That was in my day. That's the old days when the president mm -hmm. said, "I'm going to get NBC, CBS, and ABC on the phone. I have something to say tonight." Uh, it's the same thing. Only it's now a much broader. Doesn't doesn't the president have a right to that bully pulpit? That's that's part of the job. That's why we elect him. Yeah, that's, that, that makes sense. It's, if it's someone that we the people elected, you know, they, well, it they, is. 
you know, it well, should have but that platform. The, yeah. But Whether there's we a agree separate to issue. Or not. Right. right. <laughs> so, sorry. I didn't, didn't it's their right to. I understand it's their right to. Yeah. Certainly. Right. It, it, the president has a right to speak, but that doesn't mean that a private company has to, to ca yeah. carry their speech. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there there are appropriate things for, for different platforms or different vehicles to carry in the same way that you wouldn't expect like, you know, ESPN to 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 carry the president's speech because it's not right. the right audience or Nickelodeon mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, right. You know, if they decide that it's not right or not appropriate for their vehicle, then they they should. You know, that's freedom of association as well. Absolutely. Um, and it's it's not like, you know, if the president wants to say something, it's not like he doesn't have ways to get that message out, even if the various Internet platforms say not through us. I, I do, and I understand that. I'm not saying there should be is there ought to be a law. There clearly is a law. It's called the First Amendment. You don't have to. Yeah. But it's just uh, devil's advocate. But well, I'm not even playing devil's advocate. I do feel like, um, if this is part of the pain, you know, all of this. It, there's all these different levers that different groups are pulling to create pain for these uh, social uh, platforms to push them in a direction that uh, people want. But I think ultimately it bothers me if the elected leader of our country is not allowed to use these platforms to speak. What, what they if have the, the right to do it. Country, what if the elected leader of your country is Bolsonaro, right? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Goodwin, please, Godwin, please. But, but, but Bolsonaro <laughs> was elected, right? I mean. Yeah, but, well, or, 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 I'm sorry, I'm going to go there if it's Hitler. Right, <laughs> Hitler was point. not. Hitler was not. Uh, you know, he was not fully elected, so that's all right. But well, he was, he was the, the he was the legal head. Yeah. He was the legal head. He made himself I mean, a little I, more. I, than sorry, that. sorry, Godwin. Please give me a, a break. Today. <laughs> I think Mike is, um, Mike has suspended Godwin's law for the last. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Couple of months. You know, so yeah. no, there is a, There has to be a limit, Leo. There has to be a limit where you say we're not going to. Um, but but yeah, yeah, I, I argued that Facebook should leave it up, but should say should model the behavior of disapproving of the essence of it and say, this is here and here's why it's here, but by it being here, we are not endorsing this. I, you know, and by the way, I, as you, I think everybody knows, I'm no friend of the president, but, um, and I understand that Twitch should not let uh, Richard Spencer or David Duke have a stream, but uh, by the virtue of his office, he is in a different category. Sure. And, and I think that's true. And I think that's it's actually why what Twitter did, you know, a month ago was so interesting. After going back and forth where a lot of people were asking them to take down the, that account, they decided to to just add more content to it and, and put more context to it and saying things like this. This does violate our policy. That but seems because like a fair response. Is, we're, we're yeah. leaving mm -hmm. up. And, and, mm -hmm. and Facebook last week announced that they're going to start doing the same thing after originally saying that they, they wouldn't were. do that. That's right. They're, they're now saying that they'll do it. And, and yeah. to me, that is that is a a pro free speech it's adding more speech right. uh, yes. and not removing it and recognizing that the president by the nature of being the president um you know is in a unique position and therefore has unique rules and some people get upset about that and saying well you know everybody should be treated exactly the same but but the president is not the same as everybody else no. yeah um what else, Jeff? What what what's next? What are we talking? Oh, oh, we haven't even talked about anything. In, in I, you know, I'll tell you one thing. I really loving. So Apple changed how iOS 14 works with privacy in a very aggressive way. Um, you know, they're 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 surfacing all sorts of stuff like the Apple ID for advertising, which you can now like when you first install an app, say yeah, don't do that, which advertisers are terrified about. Uh, mm -hmm. They also are showing all sorts of privacy violations. TikTok, the first to bit, but now that there's 56 different apps that spy on your clipboard, even when you're not running the app. And Apple's new notifications are letting people know about that. Um, Apple's turning out to be, I think it's kind of interesting, just by a slight change to iOS, which is widely used, of course, in the U.S., they turn out to be narking on a lot of these uh, things. And I have to say, at this point, uh, I would not be using TikTok anymore. The uh, country of India has banned yeah. TikTok and 59 other apps. Well, that's for another reason. Well, they're, quote, Chinese apps, uh, and that's right. because of border tensions. Yes. Uh, share it, the UC browser, and TikTok. Yeah, it's not because of privacy violations, although they claim it's because they're worried that those apps 
uh, were engaged in activities that were prejudicial to the sovereignty, integrity, and defense of India. Uh, they can apparently do this. This is, you know, we forget that the First Amendment is a unique and wonderful piece of uh, the American Constitution, but not widespread. Um, anything to say about that? Either one of those? I would not use TikTok. TikTok. Looked pretty bad. TikTok looked pretty damn bad. Yeah. What did what, what did you guys think? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it is. These things get more and more complicated. I'm I'm not going to defend TikTok because I think yeah I, I agree that that it seems that they rushed into a lot of this uh, without much thought and then there. This are, is the new the excuse potential. though. This is the Zoom excuse. Yeah. You know yeah. sure. we were just trying to make a nice product here. We didn't really expect anybody to bother to <laughs> check out us. It's, it's the same theory of move fast and break stuff. That's, yeah, it's the same theory. Yeah, and maybe it is that. I mean, it's you yeah, can't but you it's can also, never impute, I mean, inten impute intention. Sure, but it's also I mean, it's is it's also the nature of innovation, right? And like sort of how how it works and this idea of like, you know, the minimum viable product and and you know getting stuff out there quick and iterating, um, and that is how a lot of innovation happens. And so like mm -hmm. I can see both sides of it, and I can completely understand the argument that like this looks really bad and they should do better, and I agree with that. But I also, the one sort of hesitation, the one point where I step back a little bit is I say, do we even get these innovations in the first place if you say you have to have it perfect the first time out? And I think we would probably end up losing a lot of the innovations that eventually do come out of this process. And it's a very messy mm -hmm. process and there are obvious problems with it. And that's, that is what we're talking about. And I don't mean to diminish that. And I don't mean to excuse like all the horrible things that, that is mm -hmm. within the TikTok app or even the mistakes that I think Zoom has made and, and is now rushing to try and fix. Um, but, you know, I think watching how these companies respond to this information as it comes out is the most important thing. And like, you know, Zoom has actually been a really interesting case study in that they seem to be one of the rare cases where they're, they're they appear to be taking all of these issues very seriously, you know, have brought on really good people and have been very transparent about all the changes that they're making. We'll see about TikTok. Um, but but it, hasn't you know, Zoom been talking out of both sides of its mouth with well, we're, we're encrypt. Everything is going to be encrypted, and we can't see it. But yet, we still have the keys. Are they still talking that story? They they've been changing that. You know, as as they've gotten more and more pushback on on the setup of how they were doing it, um, they they've been changing. But again, like the 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 theme of all of all of this is that every one of the choices that they make has trade-offs, right? And, and understanding yep. which of the, right. which of the bad decisions you have to make uh, yeah. is really difficult. And it's really, you know, it's, it's fun to criticize them because I do that all the time, but recognizing like being in their shoes, like, I don't know exactly which decision I would make either. Right. Um, I can see you so smiling right now as you talk about <laughs> it. Oh, I say that all the time as, as Jeff knows uh, and Ant knows about Facebook and Google and Twitter as well. Yeah. You know, these are tough decisions. It's interesting that Apple, for whatever reasons of its own, has decided to come step forward and become the defender. They just turned down a bunch of uh, web UIs proposed by the W3C because they would enable fingerprinting on Safari. And they said, you know, we're not going to implement. There's no reason an app, need, you know, a web app needs... Uh, access to the accelerometer or the GPS coordinates, except that there is if you want to make your web browser be, you know, support application like behavior on the internet, which many people do, there's good reason for those UIs. And so I don't think the W3C is proposing them out of uh, some sort of secret cabal with advertisers. But I think it's also interesting that Apple said, yeah, we don't think so uh, because they could be used to fingerprint you. I mean, things like exactly how much RAM you have. Uh, why does a browser need to be able to report that? I just I, and so you you nailed it, Mike. There are reasons people do this, not necessarily nefarious, but I would also submit there's really reasons to say no. I don't run mm -hmm. Facebook, sure. I don't run Instagram, I don't put TikTok on my phone anymore because basically I think most apps these days are really a wrapper around data collection tools. Yes. You yeah, know. most. What can we do to make it sexy so that you'll install it <laughs> so that we can find out everything you're uh, doing and sell it? That's yes. that's the business we're in right now. So yeah, you know, I, then I, there's I, also the, the the level where you'll see those little reports to say, hey, send this crash report or something like that for like a uh, Adobe. Uh, there's some privacy implications there too. Generally, my friends uh, on MacBreak Weekly yell at me because when you install. 
apps uh, on Apple's uh, devices, there's often, uh, there's always a checkbox. Do you want to send data back to the app developer? Uh, and I always say, yeah, because I want to help them be, have, make a better app. Right. And they right, said, because you have that, that, that mindset of a developer. Yeah. I mean, you are the yeah. Linux guy. I would like to know, know so that. You know, I want to know sense. when you're opening it and why and how long you spent. And, but they say, no, Leo, that's you're just enabling TikTok to collect you're all mining. that information. <laughs> you're, you're, you're giving them all the jewels that they're trying to mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I choose to say yes and then not install uh, apps. And then I guess the apps I install, I'm tacitly saying, go ahead, collect what you need. Relax. Oh. It's okay, Leo. It's okay. It's, okay. it's going to be all right. <laughs> Calm down. Face recognition software, finally, as Mike Masnick puts it, actually Tim Cushing puts it, on Tector, gets around to arresting an innocent person. Uh, this is a pretty horrific story uh, yeah. uh, that uh, comes out of uh, Detroit, Detroit Police Department. Uh, got a grainy, grainy picture uh, from a CCTV camera. Uh, the worst. Uh, the, yeah, uh, the worst. And it was a low-res screen grab to boot uh, of a robbery <laughs> occurring, and they fed it through, who knows, might have been Clearview AI, whatever they were using for face recognition, and uh, came up with uh, this guy. I'm not going to say his name because the poor guy's had enough trouble. Uh, he got a call right. from the police department saying, come on in, you're going to be arrested. He says, at first I thought I was a prank and ignored it. An hour later, when he pulled into his driveway in Farmington Hills, a police car pulled up behind him, blocked him. Two officers got out, handcuffed him in front of his wife and two mm. young daughters. Mm. They wouldn't say why he was being arrested, just showed him a piece of paper with his photo and the words felony, warrant, and larceny. This is the worst part. When his wife said, where are you taking my husband? The officer says, Google it. Like, mm. I, don't, I don't even know what that's mm. supposed to mean. I don't yeah. even, Google it. What the hell are you talking about? Where are you taking him? Uh, hey, so, the, the show is finally about Google. Yeah, finally. <laughs> See, I got the word Google in. I had to work on it, but I did. So, An hour uh, and 40 minutes in. We got it. We man. got the word in. Um, so, unfortunately, um, oh, the, by the way, the police said, well, wait a minute. We didn't just use the face recognition. We showed uh, him his driver's license photo to the loss prevention person at the store, and she supposedly identified him. In any event, they eventually had to uh, let him go and apologize. But the poor guy went through hell, yeah. um, including being held in jail for several hours before being released on a $1,000 bond. Well, what? 18 yeah. hours in 18 bond? hours. Yeah. yeah. Eight, 18 hours. Yeah, it's a good thing he had 1000 bucks. He was in there for 18, uh, 18 hours in a holding and cell. He, he's now he's now suing. Good. So the AC, oh, yeah. ACLU took up his case and they're they're suing over that uh And by the way, had they bothered to ask or investigate, he he had an alibi. He couldn't have done it. He had posted a video to his Instagram account at that time. On his way see, home from work. See, you see, mm. social media is good. <laughs> there you go. So I got Google in and you got that in. So well done, Jeff. We've, we've, we've fulfilled our missions. We can go home happy. I do not mean to make light of this terrible story. but It's I, terrible. I and this is why everybody, uh, and I think eventually this is going to happen, including Congress now is talking for putting a face recognition on hold. Of course, he's black. I should have mentioned yeah. that the poor guy is black and that's why he was recognized. Uh, the, you know, I don't or give a damn if it was a white guy. This, it was well, it's still terrible, but <laughs> but but the false positives in face recognition are so high. Yeah, probably put any it's black right. guy in front of that face recognition and say, "Oh yeah, he did it. He looks guilty." Oh lord, it's flat yeah, out wrong. One, I don't sort of know the, 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 Go ahead. Sorry, Ed. go ahead. No, no, you. I don't no, know no, the go. law or anything like far as all of the extents of of, of warrants and whatnot, but. It seemed a little bizarre that they walked up and just immediately slapped the handcuffs on him. I thought they at least had to tell them, you know, what's going on and start going through the Miranda right stuff. You well, know. this is the other problem, right, in policing in general, but with his face recognition. they can The police consider that ample evidence. This guy did it. Okay. So they treated him as a perp, right? They didn't okay. treat him as a suspect or well, let's investigate. Gotcha. No, no. The, fa the computer said he did it. 
Okay. That was sufficient right. to them. In fact, the contractors that supplied the AI system <laughs> even said, <laughs> maybe this is, you know, ret retroactively, a match using facial recognition alone is not a means for positive identification. Well, what do you make this stuff for? <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's hope uh, this, is, this was going to happen. Uh, fortunately, nobody was injured, uh, but it's... You know, it's shameful, and it just proves why this has got to stop. And I think it, give I, me I, facial I, recognition to make autofocus even better. There on you go. That's all I need. I Put it in the camera. I that's what I want. Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah. Um, we could actually go on. There's more. Uh, according to Business Insider, leaked documents show how police use social media and private Slack channels to track protesters, George Floyd, Floyd protesters. Um. But I, you know, it's too depressing. Is there a larger? No. Of but this is not. this is an example. This is an example of of kind of what Mike was saying earlier. I'm stretching it, Mike. But what the hell? Um, <laughs> is that when possible you blame the technology? Whereas what yeah. the last few weeks have shown us is there is a systemic issue in police and the institution of policing in the United States. And the fact that they misuse technology is only one of a myriad. That's of problems. That's true. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll connect it to another story just for fun, <laughs> which is the, the, the discussion on encryption. Uh, and you have all these police who are keep, keep saying we have to have backdoors to encryption. We have to break encryption because we can't find out any information anymore. And yet in both of these stories, what did we see? We saw police who, if they used technology properly, could have actually gotten <laughs> useful information yeah. from from social you know, media. all of these sources, yeah. social media or or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I had a story not too long ago that, that sort of touched on this with these examples of like the FBI tracked down somebody who had had lit a fire. I lit a police car on fire by, you know, uh, I forget the exact details. It was this crazy string of, of things where they, there was a woman who was wearing a shirt that had a saying on it and they tracked that shirt to Etsy and they found a what? review <laughs> that matched her name and they found well, her LinkedIn that's profile. That's police work. That's yeah. what I'm And it was about. like actual detective work. Manix, it, baby. <laughs> but but in that same story, there was also examples of the FBI, you know, arresting people based on social media posts where they were sarcastic, right. you know, satirical posts rather than any actual criminal behavior. And so you have all of these things where, you know, law enforcement really they have all these new tools, but they haven't figured out how to use them. And, you know, they sort of jump into the sort of lazy explanations where if we think this is a crime, it's a crime. Right. Uh, and that creates all sorts of problems. And so, you know, there's there's a real issue here where if we're going to have law enforcement doing this before we say, let's break encryption, you know, let's figure out if there's a way that they can actually use the technology that they have in front they of them. They have the best high def picture ever of everything <laughs> that's going on. Come on, give me a break. They just don't like these little one or two blank pixels they, they want to see the whole thing they want it to be perfect <laughs> yeah. no blank pixels uh somebody in the chat room says they're barnaby jonesing it they're doing it man they're <laughs> <laughs> uh today's the day the california consumer privacy protection act goes into effect you're in charge of the world now california it's us baby forget <laughs> gdpr we got the ccpa I don't know what's going to happen. Although I do see a lot of companies uh, now putting disc CCPA disclaimers and trying to uh, trying to CYA, yeah, <laughs> at least CYA, yeah. Mm -hmm. It gives internet users in California, hence the world, the right to request businesses not to sell uh, uh, or even and even delete their personal information, kind of like GDPR. Uh, but there's still questions, according to Adweek. Of course, Adweek would be all over this about what counts as selling information and which party manages opt out. Mm -hmm. the CCPA defines a sale as selling, renting, releasing, disclosing, disseminating, making available, transferring, or otherwise communicating orally in writing or by electronic or other means a consumer's personal information by the business to another business or a third party for monetary or other valuable consideration. <laughs> it's a very interesting definition of selling. Yeah. Well, you could put away Was the thesaurus Ed? and just, yeah, right. By, by the way, it doesn't have to be for money. It doesn't have to be for money. Valuable consideration could be mutual benefit. Uh, was Ad Week assuming that there's a third party managing all of this and this isn't just the government managing all of these, these checks and balances coming in for people that want to opt out? Uh, that's an interesting question. No, I think that 
at least with GDPR, it's up to it's up to us, for instance, to enforce. Yeah, to, uh, it's mm -hmm. it's the companies that have to enforce it. Yeah. The okay. uh, the the California Attorney General can go after companies that don't do it. Um, and then there's, you know, there are other aspects to, to it. It's, it's, it's going to be a mess just as GDPR was a mess. And, and if you look at kind of the results of GDPR in a lot of cases, it's really just given more power to the big companies that can, right. that can deal with it and created all sorts of problems for the, for the smaller that's guys. That's really true. That's, that's unfortunately really true. Although I welcome these protections. I think we need them. I, I, I think having protections is good. I mean, the CCPA, uh, what bothers me is that it was it was a very rushed job, and it's why like you know part of it went into force six months ago it, without the actual regulations. It's the new regulations that went into force today, uh, but because it just wasn't ready, because they just kind right. of rushed the whole thing. And and privacy, you know, if if the stuff we were talking about before is complex and crazy and has all different trade offs, privacy is a is uh, you know at an entirely different level of of trade offs so and complexity, uh, and and. You know, that's not the kind of thing that you should rush a law through. And so I, I am supportive of the idea of better protecting privacy in so many different ways. And I think the companies are terrible at it. But I do not think that this is the, the proper vehicle for doing it. There will be an extension to it because, uh, as uh, Mike knows, here in California, we have we've decided that the assembly doesn't want to do any work. So they've decided to let the voters <laughs> vote. There will be a ballot initiative in November called the California Privacy Rights Act, which would expand uh, the definitions of the CCPA, uh, make it even more uh, dramatic. Uh, uh, for instance, a business would be any entity that buys, sells, or shares the personal information of 100,000 or more consumers or households. So the previous threshold, 50,000. Uh, by increasing that number, the idea is protect small businesses. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Um and under CCPA, consumers have the right to know what pieces of information a company has collected over a 12-month period. The ballot initiative would extend that period to any time so long as it takes proportionate effort, whatever the hell that means. Um, they would also You know, the problem here is the same as before, is that there, this, this, this saying selling your data is not defined. Right, data is a transactional right. among parties, and who owns it, and what it is. It's the same as saying, "Get rid of hate." It's tough. Well, what's hate? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and they're leaving. It just drives me nuts. Well, and to yeah. answer your question, Ant, the uh, the ballot initiative does, in fact, propose creating a uh, an agency to enforce the California Privacy Protection Agency, and they right. yeah. enforce it. It's some of the stuff with the ballot initiative is a little bit sketchy, too, because the whole reason we had the CCPA in the first place is because the same guy got a ballot initiative in California on the ballot that was even worse initially. And the CCPA was that's compromised. Right. Which, it was, that's right. Which it was, was basically, that. yeah. right, we will we will pass this you know hastily written law that is not as crazy as your ballot initiative if you drop the ballot initiative. And so he dropped the ballot initiative. They passed the CPA, CCPA, put it into effect, and six months later, he's back with another ballot initiative. And right. you're like, wait, I thought we had a deal where you were going to back <laughs> oh, off. Oh, I didn't realize this is from that same guy. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Same guy. Same oh. guy. Yeah. So Ant, who has just moved to California, you're going to get used to this. <laughs> we tend to have very big ballots with lots of initiatives because it's fairly easy to put an initiative on the ballot. Yeah. And a lot right. of them are kooky as hell. The most famous one, Prop 65, which was the one that mandated that uh, anybody, any place that has cancerous chemicals in it has to notify, which has <laughs> had the kind of mm. unintended end result that there's a sign on everything with a Prop 65 warning mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if you noticed that, right, everywhere you go, oh, yeah, this, oh, you can get cancer here. Oh, you sure yep. can get cancer here. That box would cause you cancer. But they, but they Unintended have to do it. Unintended consequences, yeah, folks. Yeah, they have to do it. So we get, we yep. get a lot of those in our initiative. I've seen some of that type of uh, stuff on the ballots back in Carolina, too, so yeah. I'm not surprised. I'm sure it's, you know, it's <laughs> legislators who don't want to get beyond the hook for uh, making any any real laws. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. Why we now have to click through on every web page saying like, okay, yep. privacy, this cookies, cookie, cookie, that cookie. Right. It becomes Nobody, meaningless. Nobody's paying attention to any of that. Yeah. Right. Same thing. It's meaningless. Yeah. Same thing. Most yeah. of those, by the way, don't have a, I don't want you to do that. Right. <laughs> they just, all right. you can do is say, I agree. Would you leave me alone? I agree. 
Well, my uh, favorite are the ones that, that say I agree or they just have an X to close it. And I'm like, so if I close I it, what happens? What happened? Right. I don't That's know. What, I yeah. wonder. what happens if I just close <laughs> it? Is that an acknowledgement? Is it a decline? Or Ask, yeah. ask Microsoft. Ooh, They've done that in some of their pop-ups before. <laughs> and we can, Ooh, we hey, Scoop from Kara Swisher. Sp She's oh, just no. tweeted, you can officially call it Techapalooza. Rep Representative David Cicciolini has told me in an interview today, the four CEOs of the most powerful tech companies in the world, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, Cook, Zuckerberg, uh, Pachai, and Bezos have agreed to appear at a late July hearing on antitrust. That's a big, big oh, deal. Buy popcorn futures. That's going to be one. <laughs> we might stream. We'll stream that live. We ought to stream that live. Is it? It's. I can. Where can I? I mean, that should be. C SPAN. Be Can't you stream C SPAN? Can I stream C SPAN? Yeah. It's like NASA, right? It's we paid for. Yeah, because the Washington it's, Post. It's, it's you know. Yeah. The Washington Post it's and the New York Times domain. put it up. Yeah. Public domain. Say government news normally runs that stuff too. So. Although I, you probably know this, Mike, but we we like to stream the space launches. We stream NASA TV, and the last time we streamed the the Dragon Crew launch, National Geographic took down everything. Yes, saying, I we, wrote about that. I, I wrote about yeah. it. Everybody got. We own uh, space. That's ours. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just a switch. It, it again, happens every time. Again, and and this is I really like your point of view. You cannot impute uh, uh, malice when just simple stupidity or, or, <laughs> right. or even just mistakes apply. And in this case, there's just a checkbox National Geographic either did or didn't check that said, you know, we own this. And, and the, it, the real error is YouTube's content ID system, which is so automated and so fast that there's, and, and really the appeal process takes forever. It's crazy. Hey, good news. The Supreme Court agrees. <laughs> An eight to one decision, ladies and gentlemen. I got to see, see who the dissenter was uh, on this one. Booking.com had tried to register its name with the PTO. The, the patent office rejected the filing, saying that's generic. You can't, you can't trademark booking. You can't trademark that. Booking said, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, so Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the majority said the public perception of a name is the core issue. If Booking.com were generic, we might expect consumers to understand Travelocity to be a Booking.com. But they don't. They know better. Who right. was the dissent? I doesn't say. Gosh darn it. <laughs> so just, this this actually involves my old career. When I worked for Advance, uh, we had, uh, for example, New Jersey Online, which we called NJO, but the URL was NJ.com. Everybody was confused as hell. So we finally went with nj.com as the brand and the url but knowing that we would not get a trademark or we'd have problems with the trademark claims because it was mm -hmm. generic now nj.com al.com for alabama um nola.com no longer theirs NOLA, that's right yeah you know they uh they, they they're the well it's not, ajc is a is not a generic right it stands mm. for something whereas nj is very New Jersey, generic. yeah it's New yeah. Jersey. Yeah. So you could, we couldn't claim ownership of New Jersey, gotcha. but, we, but we, they now can claim ownership of NJ.com. It sounds kind of retroactive, though, like you have to establish that everybody knows what Booking.com is, and then you can say, oh, yeah, that's our trademark. It's like you can't, I mean, how would you defend it if mm. it didn't exist? And you say, I know I want it. It's a, it, Stephen Breyer was the dissenting uh, justice, but I don't think he wrote a dissent. He just said, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I'm again it. Um, so anyway, that you know, among meaningless Supreme Court rulings, that that <laughs> probably is right up there. But I so guess. I know you discussed it on, on your eighty three other shows, boss. Nonstop, I'm sure. What? But I'm curious. Apple. Uh, Mic Apple. Micro no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Apple. Um, <laughs> Microsoft closing its stores. Well, it's tied into the Apple thing. Yeah, they were losing yes. money. There, they just there was a big red blot on their. I always felt sorry for the staff. Like, I'm, I'm almost as cool as an Apple guy. They, uh, yeah. I mean, they were always empty. <laughs> Did you ever go buy one? First of all, they made, oh, made I bought big, my daughter's computer there. They made a big mistake because they look like Apple stores and they're near Apple stores. So the, right. the comparison is vivid as you walk by one. Yes. It looks like a party, you know, people are laughing. And, <laughs> yeah, they're practically doing marimba, conga line. And, so, and then the next door, it's like, 
da, 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 da. You, can hear the, <laughs> you can hear the crickets. <laughs> this, John, uh, uh, Paul Therod said the, the squeaky sign on the hinge as the wind, <laughs> the wind blows through the store. Anyway, they weren't very successful. Uh, they're closing them. I made it more than it is, which was kind of the writing on What's the wall. Job? For, yeah, that's my job is to blow things out of proportion. <laughs> as the writing on the wall for the post-PC era uh, that Microsoft just, you know, Microsoft knows its business is not computers or selling computers or even Windows. Not its anymore. business is the cloud. And That's right. in fact, it's a great business. They they were smart. They 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 moved their whole business to something that everybody's going to be coming to. Um, and they were smart. And so the stores have no real That's purpose. That's all Nadella. That's all Nadella. That's such an Nadella. Yeah. yeah. So, so were they as smart? Okay, question then. Um, who did a better pivot, Microsoft or Netflix? Um, I would like to say Netflix had yeah. already had that in the cards anyway from the get-go. Well, do you remember, though, how much uh, opprobrium that Reed Hastings got when he said, we're going to split into two businesses, the DVD mm -hmm. business yeah. and the and the streaming Quickster. business. Quickster? Quickster, yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> good, one. good memory, and, and, and people thought, <laughs> "No, that was you Mr. Mike. Nuts! You're, you're, what are you doing, you insane <laughs> person? You." And of course, he was exactly right. Um, yeah, but I think you know, I think the the Netflix. Uh, disruption and, and change was a more linear one. Like you can see the easy yes, path there. The train was Whereas coming. the Microsoft change, yeah. that's, you know, that's a completely different business. Yeah. And it, mm -hmm. it, it involved like a very different set of, of skills and outlook and structure to the business, in fact. And it very much is, you know, Nadella's ability to come in and completely Brilliant move that company in Brilliant. a very, very different direction is yep. really, really impressive when you think about it. Whereas, you know, the Netflix, I think everybody kind of understood, like that's where Netflix has to go. But that, that was not nearly as obvious with Microsoft. So I, I would both, argue that the Microsoft. Netflix Microsoft. actually made two pivots. Uh, both of them, you know, the economic exigencies required. But the pivot from streaming other people's content to making their own was sure. arguably much more significant and and properly executed. They became the dominant content creator and have done yeah, very well. That's true. Yeah. So I would say I'm not sure which one you were talking about, Ant. I uh, I would say the pivot, the second pivot might have been more important, not more prescient. Because they knew they were losing movies. All the movie companies were saying, you can't have the, you can't have no, the good no, stuff. No, I was just saying that it seems like Netflix had already had that in the cards before we yes. even conceived it as consumers. Right. Where Microsoft, oh, okay. on the other hand, was saying, you know what? Ooh, we're getting our butts kicked on this particular side of things of the market, and we're getting our butts kicked over here. But on the enterprise side of things, hmm, we seem to keep doing our thing and doing okay. So let's just go ahead and move cloud-wise with Azure and, and all of that good stuff. And, and th I think that's most impressive there. Well, here's the interesting thing that I brought up. After drinking the apple Kool-Aid and basking in the reality distortion field and enjoying the excitement of Apple Silicon, it kind of came to me, Apple's making this change also in a post-PC world. And Apple's doubling down on computers. Fortunately, they have mobile and they're doing very well in mobile, uh, which Microsoft does not. So Microsoft didn't have that. And I don't know if that's an advantage to Apple or a disadvantage. It's keeping them in the hardware game when it may in fact be that the future of computing is cloud-based, and all you need is some sort of thin client to access it, and it won't really matter. Well, then what does Apple have to offer in that world? You know what? I, I realize there is a path forward for Apple as a fashion accessory, because mm -hmm. Paul Therott said this. When you, okay, so you're going to need something, your thin client. Apple can make the best-looking <laughs> thin clients with the best yeah. battery life and the coolest and the thinnest. And in a way, they already are, are doing that. So there is a path forward to them. They'll be the thin, yeah, but, the thin client company. It's not as much money as yeah. Microsoft's going to make. Who's I mean, I do, I do think they have, they have a challenge in the services side of things, right. and I think Apple, Apple has realized that. And you know, the most interesting thing that I've heard people say is like, why doesn't Apple buy Box? or Dropbox or something right. like that and build a services business on top of that. Uh, you know, they have iCloud, but that is, you know, not quite the same thing right now. Well, as you know, <laughs> that's 
historically really hard to do. You have this big culture yes. clash. You don't take a company that, that is terrible at services and is terrible <laughs> at cloud and just buy a cloud company and say, see, we fixed right. it. Because <laughs> that's, you know, uh, you, yeah. that's, and a, Apple that's is, not a synergy. It's not. I mean, they've bought, they've certainly bought companies, but um, they, don't know, like they have it. not done done yeah. the, the the really big massive uh, purchases and 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 figuring out ways to move those in house and that is yes a, a an arena that is very very difficult to get right right and Apple knows that actually Apple has said that yes. specifically we don't want to have to do all of that culture adjustment so that we can acquire a big company I mean and you can look at all the wreckage of you know what was it Compaq uh, yes. you know uh, I mean you can Less go on and on and go, you know yeah HP Compaq or um, Warner Brothers AOL and or, you know Time Warner AOL. There's been a, a lot of those bad acquisitions. So anyway, it's interesting to think of of the Microsoft store somehow tying into the Apple Silicon story. Uh, two different takes on what the future of computing will look like. Perhaps that's my. If I were Mike Masnick or somebody with his brains, I'd write a <laughs> I'd write a think piece on that. But I'm not. I don't. I, the other day, I started writing a blog just because I thought, you know, I really probably should organize whatever this mush is up here, and uh, because I realized that my job really is just to have a thought, speak it, and it goes and it's gone, and I don't have to be held accountable or anything. Perfect for the age. <laughs> it's great. I love it. Uh, and so I thought I should start writing a little bit because that forces a discipline. But then I look at people like you, Mike, or Ben Thompson, and I go, yeah. I don't. I don't even know how to start. Thinking that, <laughs> thinking that hard, deep stuff. That's, that's why I don't write. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I need a thesis. What? <laughs> I have no thesis. I am thesis free. Let's do play the drums. The Google Change Log. The Google Change Log. This is where we pay lip service to being called this week in Google. <laughs> Google Sheets will soon be able to auto-complete data for you. Google's going to become the auto-complete company. It's the one uh, thing they really do. Well. Yeah, it really, it really, it really amused me. Yeah. Like, oh, we're, oh, you actually should be making profit this quarter. We're going to just put that in. Yeah. <laughs> the 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 risk of this is it becomes Microsoft Clippy. I see you're trying. I see you're trying to make profit. Can I help? <laughs> uh, that, that would be an interesting lawsuit on, on the two thirty front. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we invented. We in, yeah, really. Who's liable for that? If you uh, right. screwed up my balance sheet, they call it. Uh, it's kind of. It's kind of smart fill. It's kind of like smart compose. Uh, Gmail finish your sentences for you. Uh, I don't know. Google explains. Say you have a column full of names but you want to split it into two columns. By the way, I do this all the time. As you start typing the first names into a column, like in other words, as you start doing this manually, Sheets will say, oh, I get it. You're trying you to- idiot. You moron. Help. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll just fill it in for you. Look at that. Formula suggestion. I guess that'll be useful. That's perfect for someone like me that, that hates spreadsheets and yeah. Yeah. I've never been a spreadsheet person. I, Only if I'm doing like a- um, a massive data load into the database. Yeah. That's that was it, and that's only because it's a flat file. That's yeah. right. For years, I've spent hours like trying to figure out stupid things like this. How do I, <laughs> how do I get the city and state in separate fields in the zip code? How do I? And it's just a pain in the butt. But you, you know, now it'll, Google will do it for you. By the way, Smart Complete is also coming to Google Messages or Smart Compose, I guess. So as you just said, it is the, I'll complete that for you. You don't even have to think now. You don't even have to say it. Maybe it'll write Google my uh, blog it. posts for me. Yeah, exactly. There yeah. you go. <laughs> I want, I need a Leo complete. Holy cow. Did you hear that? Yeah. yeah Jeez. Right wow. there. Uh, You're going to sleep good tonight. Holy moly. <laughs> that was I don't a, get killed. That was quite a <laughs> thunderbolt there. That if we lose power, we do have a generator, but it takes a few minutes to come in, so... Wow. Um, Meet is uh, being upgraded in many ways as Google scrambles. <laughs> must have Google must have just like, why is Zoom beating? I know Microsoft's yeah. like, oh, <laughs> what is with Zoom? Where, oh, look, here's one of those cookie things. Uh, uh, I don't even have a close. I just have accept. It's just accept. <laughs> right. I thought I turned, uh, supposedly in uBlock Origin, if you turn on... I, th I thought there was a way in settings. If you turn on 
Jeez Louise. <laughs> Should I go on mute? Jeez Louise. No, no, I love it. Are you kidding? That's awesome. Awesome. We don't get thunder and lightning here in California. No. You don't? No. no. Just, no. just wind. Just earthquakes. <laughs> just earthquakes. Yeah. Uh, and they're quieter. They're, they're much quieter. quieter. Here comes another one. Wow. So how many sec? Are you counting the seconds? Uh, no. I forgot how to do that. That's Seven right seconds a mile per mile. I remember that I from it was my five. I, I just go to dark sky and look at the. Uh, <laughs> you just look at the. I look at the radar map. What are you I talking about? Radar. Seconds. Yeah, what do you need? Exactly what are you crazy? Whatever. Google Meet is going to be upgraded for education users. Uh, blah blah blah. When somebody asks to join a meeting or knocks, they won't be able to knock again if you are if you reject them. This is always a problem with these meetings, you know, interlopers. And a knock will no longer show up after a moderator rejects it twice. I guess there's a problem in classrooms where you get kids just knock, knock, knocking on meetings door. Um, educators will be able to mute all participants at the same time. Disable intermeeting chat for participants. This is all about teachers and, and students, right? Yep. And restrict who can present. Do you use Meet in uh, for your classrooms, Jeff? No, we're using, we're using Zoom. We Zoom. started with, with Meet, but... Um, Google got hit by such surprise. The quality, the video quality was terrible. It really was oh, terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, they, uh, they just got zapped. So my friend, uh, Chris Marquardt, who is a uh, really great photographer, has created a new uh, website called uh, sensei.photo. And it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching. I'm trying to find the name of the program he uses because he said, oh, we found a really good program for education he started it like a month or so ago, yeah it's right? brand new he's doing hmm. portfolio reviews and so forth i'll find the i'll find the uh, name of it but uh yeah he we talked about it because he's he found a much better solution Ooh, eager to hear yeah you find it, send it to it's me, designed for teaching i will i'll find out and i'll send it to you um, shoot, I wish I had. I could remember. I can't remember it off the top of my head either but yeah. I remember, remember him talking the about announcement. it yeah I wonder what he used. Last Friday, I spent six solid straight hours on Zoom, no break. Ugh. Mm, there is really something uh, called Zoom fatigue, isn't there? Yeah, but, He's using, you know, but I also think I used to have to commute an hour and three quarters each way. True. So, true. Do you miss your train time? You know, I miss listening to more books. This is but, what he's using, and actually a lot of schools use it. It's called Big Blue Button. You've probably tried it. No, I haven't. Yeah, a lot of schools use this. It's designed for online learning. Hmm. You, you tell the dean. Let the dean know. Anyway, uh, moving right along with... <laughs> I am so easily sidetracked. <laughs> so Squirrel. So Squirrel, what? <laughs> Did you say something? So Apple for a while has used... The, the one feature in its new phones is the ultra-wideband chip, the U1 chip, that knows where you are in space, and it's used it for its airdrop feature, the feature that allows you to take a photo on a phone and share it to somebody else. And using this U1 chip with another person with a U1 chip, you can aim. So if there's 10 people standing here and I want to share it with that one, I can actually aim it at that one. Uh, Google is now rolling out their version of airdrop. It's called Nearby Sharing. They've, they've been way behind on this one. Of course, it's fitting because Apple's stolen everything from Android for this new version of iOS. <laughs> perfect timing. Can you get wow. Takata and Fugue? That was perfect timing. <laughs> I feel like this is a uh, Vincent Vincent Price movie <laughs> here. We're just, just tell Twitter I love them. <laughs> oh my gosh! Get some thunder. <laughs> get some thunder. Thunder and lightning, very, very frightening. All right, enough of that. Sorry, I got distracted. Uh, you see the problem? You see the go. problem? Uh, <laughs> Poor uh, Mike is saying, how long do you do this? <laughs> Jesus, Oh, man. it goes on for hours, You guys Mike. have no life? No, we're almost done. We're, I swear to God, we're almost done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mike. Did they warn you? Uh, now uh, you know. Now you know. I, I had a, a sense. My, my kids are probably running wild in the next room. Well, but, if at any you know, point I, you want to leave, you can. You can. <laughs> no, um, this is fun. This is fun. <laughs> Good. I'm in, we're thrilled to have you. We were Anytime yeah, you we want to really come are. back. By the way, I should mention Mike has his own podcast at Tech Dirt. Um, 
tell me, tell us about your podcast there at Tech Dirt. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, a regular, normal sort of podcast. Uh, oh, the thunder. Not like this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, not like this one. Uh, you know, basically, I'm usually just trying to interview somebody who is doing interesting work, uh, you know, in and around the kind of stuff that we talk about. And it's usually sort of, you know, 35 to 45 minutes. Oh, um, geez, don't show off now. That's okay. <laughs> No, but it's, you know, about, we do, you know, we've been doing a lot of stuff about Section 230 lately. Nice. And, you know, all the different kind of legal messes generally. We're going to have something on the Earn It Act next week. So, good. All that kind of stuff. Look up the Tech Dirt podcast on iTunes or uh, wherever you get your podcasts. You put how, up how long does your average podcast episode run, Mike? Shh. <laughs> it's in that 35 to 45 minute range. So. Oh, wow. Wow. It, now that, Jeff's going to want to be on your show RV. instead. Yeah. <laughs> So this condensed. is this is condensed. That's he probably even make like is succinct and doesn't get distracted, things like that. So Google now has a new healthcare. <laughs> we can't make this up. I love it. I love it. I love it. Jeff, Jeff, can you can you add sort of like a flickering effect to, to Yeah, the light should go down. <laughs> Just get that underneath light, you know, the Boris Karloff <laughs> light. And now there we go. Excellent. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, from the Ooh. from the crypt, the crypt keeper keeper. Rocking Jeff, under the desk, pretty Jeff soon. Jarvis. The wind shifted. Um, uh, Dan Patterson's story with CBS. He talked to Joe Corkery of uh, Director of Product Management, Healthcare and Life Science at Google Cloud. They uh, they have a new API, the healthcare API, to let uh, to support healthcare data interoperability. So that's a good thing. It supports a DICOM, digital imaging and communications in medicine, uh, HL7 version two, and FHIR, fast healthcare interoperability resources. Google expands its free retail listings into search as pandemic hits ad sales. Not just Facebook that's suffering from the pandemic. Yep, yep. We all are. We all are. Um, they're going to... Uh, uh, ex it was an experiment in the shopping tag. They're going to tab. They're going to expand it as adver advertisers uh, step away from the ad buy. Moving on, I don't have anything to say about that. Finally, I should have mentioned this last week. I knew about it and I forgot... Google is finally letting you use a Fi number and a voice number on the same account. This was, I've, I've been a Google. Yeah, you had big complaints about that, yeah. so I put it in there. I had yeah, to give really up happened. my Google voice account when I got Google Fi mm -hmm. if I wanted to use the same number. Uh, now you'll be able to forward voice calls to Fi. You're going to get some of that functionality back, which is weird because for the longest time we thought they were killing Google voice, but... You know Google. You know that. You know how that is. Google That's is the funny thing. You spend so much time trying to ride things out with Google, thinking they're going to fix this or improve that. But yet there's the other side of the coin where you know oh, they're going to kill this thing any day now. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you yes. just don't know. There's no, no rhyme nor as, reason. As an original Google Voice user from the very, very beginning, I have been yep. dreading dreading the, the possibility that they might kill it. It's and, great. Uh, yeah, isn't it? Me same too. here. Me too. Yep. But see, that's the sad thing because I, when I got Fi, I kept the number because, well, that's the number I use. But then I lost all functionality and voice, and it was kind of frustrating. Right. So I, I get, future generations will not have to suffer my pain. And isn't that yes. what we're all about? <laughs> all your complaints you were letting us. Yeah, they listened to you and yeah, teaching I, us I the way. I did it for you. I did it for you. <laughs> uh, Google is not going to reopen its offices next week. They're pushing it back till September. Uh, Smart. I think that I'm, I'm, I've been counting the seconds, Jeff, for you since you don't know how. It's moving away. I just want to say it's, it's going. It's going uh, actually, no, they, they, we're having a bad core coming right over. Oh yeah. Are you looking at the dark? Yeah. Are you looking at dark sky? You're looking at the. I'm now looking at AccuWeather. Nice. It's, uh, it's so we bad. reviewed some time ago. Did you ever try the Focals? And I know Anthony loved them. These were uh, heads up smart glasses. Uh, they had a little, you see, you can see on these, they had a little projector 
um, and you would put your notifications uh, heads up. Unlike Google Glass, you actually could continue mm -hmm. to look at things and do things. Uh, they were preparing Focals 2. We knew all about it. We were very excited. Anthony's very excited. Nope, not going to happen because Google just bought them. Uh, they started as Thalmic Labs in 22, and they're now, uh, 2012. They're now called North. And uh, we don't know how much Google paid. Uh, Rick Osterloh says uh, he cites North's Strong Technology Foundation. So Google may not have given up on glass. This is actually a better glass, the Focals. Don't, right I'm not doing I it again. Started. No, I'm not doing it again. Uh-uh. Uh -uh. No uh -uh. Google. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. It's still right, sitting right in the closet, and I'm still bitter. <laughs> Right after I started at Twit, that's uh, about the time when Mr. Nielsen's review yeah. went up on Hands On yeah. Tech. I, I saw those things for like five seconds, if yeah. that. I didn't really get to spend time with them, though. Yeah, I didn't either. Anthony's ki keeping them all to himself. He yeah, had to I wonder go in why. And, he had to go in and get <laughs> fitted. That was the only, you know, one of the negative of it. Well, you had to go in and get fitted for your glasses. I did. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 And then I bought the prescription lenses like yeah. an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, in for fifteen hundred bucks, in for a pound. Why yeah, in for two thousand. Go, go all yeah. the way. Uh, Google is going to have an event, and we're going to cover it uh, one week from today. Uh, it's going to be a, kind of a smart home event. Smart home. Virtual Hey Google Smart Home keynote. Uh, it was scheduled, I think, for Google I/O. Uh, this, you know, we had. There's been no hide nor hair of whatever they were going to do at I/O, including the. Pixel 4a, but this might be the beginning of a kind of a avalanche of things from that would have been at Google I.O. This will be the Smart Home Summit keynote uh, by Michaeli Turner, the product management director of the Smart Home ecosystem. Uh, we're going to have Micah Sargent and Matthew Castanelli uh, host our coverage because they are the hosts of Smart Tech today. So they, they know about this stuff, which I can't claim. Here come the kids. I hear the kids, Mike. Here they come. I was, I was wondering if I was wondering if they were that loud. Yes. I'm warning you. They're on their way. Hey, hey, like I should complain about about uh, random noise here. <laughs> um, uh, I was a little miffed when I got the notice from YouTube TV that my subscription, mm. which was recently raised from thirty five to fifty dollars, is now going to sixty five dollars. Mm. Mm, mm, hey, mm. but but there's good news. They've added the CW, so <laughs> that's, so that's worth watch. that's there's, worth the extra there's money. That oof. Um, they they got a bunch of uh, new crap channels. Um, the Viacom, CBS Family, BET, CMT, Comedy Central, MTV. MTV is still a thing. Nickelodeon, <laughs> Paramount Network, TV Land, and VH1. Uh, and then B A B E T her MTV two MTV classic Nick Jr Nicktoons T Nick all coming oh, at a Lord. later date. That's uh, worth fifteen dollars. Yep. <laughs> yep. I got this email right before um, all about Android recorded yesterday, and I was just so fired up and pissed off. Fired <laughs> up. Jason Howell and 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 Florence and Ron, they they discussed it on the show yesterday. It was a really out. good discussion. They hit a lot of good points that regular people like me were yelling about <laughs> with this mess. It's just, well, Google uh, says, and I don't think it's completely unfair that the costs of the programming have gone up. But this is, yeah, but you know, now they're cable company costs. They're exactly, exactly. They're another cable company. Yeah, it's no exactly. different it's, from the people they, that I they, cut. They have recreated the cable company, and so now they're making the Sorry, exact same arguments about. Exactly. You know, we're gonna we're gonna see like you know the carriage fights that exactly. they have with cable, where you know someone's gonna threaten to pull their yep. content, and and the prices just keep getting up and and, and up. I, I find it a little ironic, at least, that you know YouTube effectively became MTV, right? It sort of took over the mantle for what yeah. MTV was when it launched, and now they're they're pulling MTV into YouTube. I find it's that at least so a little interesting, music, but, isn't it? It's so wild. But the MTV isn't yeah. MTV anymore. No, it's yeah. reality oh, shows, oh, right? It hasn't been for a yeah, long time. Yeah. Um, Sling TV's response, we are not going to hike our prices. <laughs> but will I get <laughs> that, the that CW? That headline might not age well. No, I know. They're going to be sorry. <laughs> Already uh, Sony getting out of the game. Uh, it's got to, yeah. Basically, I, I blew the headline here. I should The headline should be, Google invents cable television. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but then again, we remember we also talked about Amazon potentially doing something like this yes. with with Prime. So I'm, 
hey, give me a holler, Mr. Bezos. Let me know what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon just added, this is not part of the changelog, but Amazon just added a uh, feature so you can watch along with uh, up to 100 friends. Yeah, the watch I love party that. thing. I think that's cool. That'll be fun. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, that's it. That's the Google changelog. Uh -huh. Thought that was the end of the show. No, that was just the end of the show. Oh God, we're not even clear here. <laughs> actually, no. I'm going to no, do you all a favor. We're, we're going to we're going to wrap things up. But first, <laughs> I, actually, first, well, I got to do this right because this is. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, oh. this is where we insert thunder into the show. No, we're, <laughs> we're going to do. It's time for our picks of the week coming up next. Actually. Coming up right now, why don't we get Aunt uh, Pruitt's pick of the week, my friend? All right. Well, I have two, and uh, for the most part, sir, I'm just going to say these picks are me. <laughs> uh, the I first pick one. me. I pick <laughs> yes. you, Aunt Pruitt. Yeah, I don't normally toot my own horn, but this time I am today. Um, I want to do you a cross shirt. promo for Hands on Tech yes. in my review. What's your review? There. I uh, did the MKE 400, which is a long name for a shotgun mic by Sennheiser. And I had a lot of fun uh, testing that out. And <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I love the start of this Of this, as you're setting up the mic, getting ready, getting the lights ready, getting the camera ready. And then, oh, oh, whoa, Mrs. Oh. Pruitt. And the, then there's that. And that the, was the other thing that I wanted to share was my tweets. In. Oh, that is my a, tweets. Oh. That was the other thing that, that I wanted to have as my pick oh. because we all know all of the crap that we're dealing with in society. And I figured, why not make something viral worth being viral? You know, so go out there. If y'all are watching Twitter, That's go out so there sweet. and heart that, retweet Bravo, that. Sir. Yeah. Bravo, sir. Spread some so freaking sweet. love around here. Yeah, spread some love. <laughs> And it's funny because, Aunt, you look so serious. <laughs> well, and, and Mr. Laporte, you know I'm fairly private. I don't share a lot of stuff. I, 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 every now and then I do some behind-the-scenes uh, things as far as photography and stuff for my people that follow me on Instagram. But yeah. most of the time I'm really private. I know, and I know. I told, you know. I told Queen earlier, I said, you never know when I'm recording. And right then I was actually testing to try to get ready for Twig. <laughs> And, uh, oh, this was you know, just this now. Is, yeah, this is just earlier today. <laughs> oh, that's you know? great. oh, oh, that's like, great. oh is it, this is like, honey, good luck. I know you. I know you. Can. Oh, it's, yeah, I, I, I pray for you, this honey. Is, You're going to this is real life. That I'll is see so you in ten sweet. hours. She's my heart. She's my queen, and I don't deserve her. But again, just spread some love. Rex on five saying. in our chat room says that's not the pick of the week. That's your peck of the week. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How about, you, how about you, Jeff Jarvis, your peck of the week? Uh, oh, well, sorry. Nobody likes me. Um, oh, I, I screwed up my lighting. Um, so, wow. It, Scary. Gods are angry with me. No, two quick things. At the, at the bottom of other, I just added in. A few weeks ago, I showed my, the guy who cuts my hair, who did a very good job last week, um, uh, did a, a pop-up pod. He, was, he didn't use that for me. But now there's a version of it at the bottom of the rundown uh, under other for the office. The pop-up uh, wearable tent wearable tent for COVID-19 protection. I could walk around in that, actually. I think so, yeah. I was thinking I was going to teach in that. And every student in it, too. Your hands, so there is a kind of, I think they need a flap to protect the hand uh, egress port. Yes. I don't know what we're going to do with that. But so then I have an actual number, which is that on the conversation, which is where academics try to speak English to the real world, uh, they did a study of Australian tweets, um, 74.2 million tweets using the WeField tool. And they found that <clears throat> unlike it's the opposite of crime. When the temperature gets higher, crimes go up on Twitter. When the temperature gets colder, people get angrier. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. Huh. I think people are generally angrier now just because they're quarantined. I've never seen more anger yeah. everywhere I go. By the way, my friend Rich DeMuro, who's the uh, KTLA awesome. tech guy and fill in for me on uh, the tech guy uh, show, actually has tested that pod. Uh, ah, ah. Uh, he, uh, he actually uh, did this for his uh, KTLA weather report, and uh, he's going to walk around his neighborhood. Kind of looks like Jude Law in the movie Contagion. 
<laughs> spreading <laughs> spreading forsythia. Look at that. Yeah. I love that guy. Rich, He's such rich, a cool yeah, cat. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> See? Walk around, you're <laughs> safe. Little did he know. <laughs> little did he know this would be so useful. I hope he kept it for this was last year. I hope he kept it for COVID. This was, I guess, on Shark Tank. <laughs> I don't oh. know if they got investment. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Mike, I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, do you have something you would like to, uh, yeah, to pick? Yeah, I, I do what? actually. I, I, I got about a 15-minute warning before the show that I needed to no, come up with. No, you know, but there's something you do that you read that you love. There's That's something you want to tell the world about, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I, 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 this sort of gets back to, to some of the conversation that, that we had throughout this this entire thing, which is that a couple of weeks ago, this new organization, or really two new organizations, launched, uh, which is the Trust and Safety Professional Association and the Trust and Safety Foundation. And uh, I actually think they're really interesting organizations that people should pay attention to. Uh, and I have a, a, a some connection to them that I'll explain in a second, but it's these organizations that are trying to sort of, you know, make the, the whole trust and safety content moderation field more professionalized and, and provide some this. training and education in that area and, and just letting people know that it is a field and that it is a profession and that it's not just Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey uh, sitting in their office deciding who to delete. <laughs> um, and uh, I think they're, they're doing some really interesting things. So there's some really, really smart people behind it. Um, and, and my very limited connection to them is that um, my organization has been writing up case studies of content moderation decisions that are being published by the Trust and Safety oh, Foundation. Neat. So, so every oh, week, yay. a couple of oh, uh, wow. case studies on the the impossible choices that everybody's making. Oh, that's so great! Uh, where can we find that? TSPA.info? Uh, no, no, that's the yeah. T yes, that is it. Is. Okay. that is it. TSPA.info. Okay. Uh, and yep, that's it. And then the, the foundation, I think there's probably a link from there to the foundation, cool. but I'm, cool. I'm blanking on it. What the foundation one is. Well, that's easy to remember. TSPA. Uh, TSF dot foundation. Oh, well that's even one. easier. Yes. TSF dot foundation. Cool. And, right uh, down. Very cool. Uh, from that's there, cool. there's, uh, the case studies and those are case studies that we've been putting together for them. So I'm going to give Karsten uh, my pick of the week this week because he found something on TechDirt's store that he's giving to his son <laughs> as a mask. The content of this mask is no longer available due to a copyright claim. That's Man, yes. awesome. we should all be wearing that. And you're, what's nice is you're donating uh, proceeds uh, to Matt MedShare up to a $500,000 um, maximum donation so that's really really that good. is yeah. awesome and of course it you have to you have to show show the show the the full picture of it because it also has the uh there, there's a different image of it that's okay. the full the the, if you do uh, the file, inside the, inside yeah. you'll be seeing the sad youtube guy that's <laughs> so funny so there's a message for you and there's a message oh i see is no, that no, the no, inside that, or the that's outside the, that's, no, the, that's, that's the, the outside that's got, the whole it. Outside, yeah. got it so. got it got it that's really that's awesome. clever <laughs> I wish we, ha we have a that. we have a t-shirt version of that that's been popular for a few years, but we just that's launched really the mask. Great, we see that's that great. a lot on our content. In fact, thanks to the Takata <laughs> and Fugue and D Major, I think we'll be seeing it again this week. Yeah, <laughs> so. the eye of the storm. I, th I think that should be out of copyright. Yeah, I would <laughs> think so. But uh, I just read an article. Down. Yeah, about yeah. A, a guy who posts. He's a professor of music, and he yeah. posts videos with his classical music in it, and uh, gets taken down all the time. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, this was fun. Thank you all for being here, Aunt Pruitt. We're going to catch your review on Hands on Tech of that Sennheiser shotgun. That sounds really good. Shotgun Mike. Let's shotgun make, Mike. Let's make that shotgun clear. Mike. Shotgun Mike. Very important. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, Hands on Wellness and Hands on Photography and uh, Hands yes, on This Week in Google. Uh, each That's week right. with us. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis. Wait a minute. Oh, no, 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 don't bother. Don't oh, bother. come on, Jeff. He's the director of the Town Heights Center for <laughs> Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. It's a running joke, Mike, because Craig listens to hear that each and every week. <laughs> well, he, he should. He, he should. should. He put up yes, some money there, I'm sure. If, if you're going to put your name on something, you should hear it when it's, when it's actually yeah. mentioned. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I would do that. <laughs> this is the you know the modern version of the sign on the building. This is this is how the modern way to get your name out there. That's right. And Mike Masnick, it's such a pleasure to so meet you to and have, have you here, on. Mike. Have we ever met? I feel like we have been on our shows before at some point. I, I think I was on your show many years many years ago. ago. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't even remember how long I ago believe it was. It, I believe it was, but I apologize for not getting you on again soon. I, I was I was probably terrible. So <laughs> no, I don't think it was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, you, no, you're more than welcome. I'm, anytime. I'm the president of the Mike Masnick fan club. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah I also thought you know it all because because you you're so wry. I knew you were a nice guy because you're right about things, but you're so wry. I thought you'd be a little growlier. You're just you're, you're, you're a really nice guy. I, it's amazing. I, I yeah. have this, yeah, there's this weird thing where people who have not met me assume that I am uh, much meaner uh, than I uh, <laughs> actually seem to be. Well, so Mike Masnick is his pin name. The other thing I love about Mike <laughs> is he's balanced. He 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 backs yeah. up his 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 uh, opinions with facts, but he always attempts to be balanced. And I think you saw that on the show today. And gosh, I hate that. So uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's really keeping us honest and yeah, all. Damn you! It's a uh, it's a pleasure having you on, Mike. We really appreciate no, it. No, thanks if, for having if me. If people aren't regular uh, readers of Tech Dirt or listeners to the Tech Dirt podcast, you should be. You're missing out. You really, really are. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this week's Thunder and Lightning, very, very frightening edition of <laughs> This Week in Google. I'm glad you were here. I think you probably are, Dorothy, too. Dorothy! <laughs> Come back, Dorothy! <laughs> da -da 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 -da. So uh, we do this show every every Wednesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. You can watch uh, the craziness live with all of the copyright violations left in if you go to <laughs> twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video there. You can catch uh, fully expurgated versions of the show at twit.tv slash twig uh, on YouTube, of course, as long as they'll leave it up. And uh, if you can't find it in all those places, you know, the best thing to do would be just fire up a podcast program, uh, launch your like pocket cast or overcast. Make sure you subscribe. And subscribe. Don't, just, don't just listen. Subscribe. Subscribe. Get every episode. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Well, and Stacy, by the way, good luck with your move. She's not here this week because this is the day of the move. Yep. I hope there's no lightning up her way in Seattle, but she'll be no, back. No, Mr. Jarvis uh, has it all. I hope so. That was <laughs> scary. That was really scary. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be finding out how the move went next week on This Week in Google. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, where each week I'm joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and a rotating crew of Android journalists, developers, and enthusiasts, where we talk about the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. You can subscribe by going to twit.tv slash AAA or find the show in your podcatcher of choice. That's All About Android. <laughs>